first bill we're going to discuss is G, AB 780, Hearing Aid Dispensers Apprentice License. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also wanted to point out um, in your binder under tab four is a memo from me um, and it gives a brief summary of all the bills we'll be discussing. So if you want to reference that, we are going to start with AB 780, um, which starts on page three of the update. Um, and the thing with legislation is it's always a snapshot in time. So even though I prepared this on April 2nd, things have changed. So I will be providing updates as of Wednesday. Things may have even changed some from as of Wednesday. So it's only in a snapshot of the time. Um, but AB 780 is going to be the uh, first bill we're discussing. The sponsor is Hearing Health Care Providers of California. Um, the bill has been set to be heard in its first policy committee, which is the Assembly Business and Professions Committee, on April 23rd. Um, and some of the key provisions of this bill are it would create a new license type, which would be titled the Apprentice Hearing Aid Dispenser License, which would be valid for 18 months while the licensee completes a training program under the supervision of an apprentice sponsor. The bill would, an al would allow an apprentice sponsor to supervise up to three apprentices at a time. This bill would also expand the scope of practice for hearing aid dispensers to include typonometry for patients 18 years of age and older. And the board would also be required to develop an examination to assess techniques and patient safety measures in typonometry. <coughs> And additionally, this bill would remove the requirement for an audiometer to be calibrated and checked annually. Um, so if you continue on the next page of my memo, which is page four, um, some of the key issues I've identified for discussion by the board um, are the significant costs for the board to create a new license type. Um, as we are on a old, IT system. Um, we aren't sure yet at this point of the cost for IT to create this new license type, um, but we anticipate there would be cost for that as well as um, developing a new application. Of course, the bill also requires a new examination for typonometry, um, which would also involve significant costs to do that as well as to run the tests. Um, board staff works at all of our exams as well, so there would be costs for that. And then also um, there's quite extensive regulations that would need to be developed, which would be my responsibility to develop. Um, so you already have the person to do it. However, the issue is that puts further back other regulations that we already have a backlog of regulations that do need to be developed. Um, additionally, this bill may harm consumers by allowing apprentice sponsors to supervise up to three apprentices at a time. Um, currently, with, I believe with um, trainees, they supervise one and may petition for up to three. Is that correct, I believe? Um, so that is significantly more apprentices than is allowed currently in law for trainees. And then also not requiring audi audiometers to be properly calibrated. Um, it's unclear why that is being removed from the bill. Um, so as you can see, based on all these issues, um, board staff is recommending an opposed position on this bill. However, um, I believe it's also important to give our executive officer authority to negotiate amendments um, as we see if this bill is moving forward. Due to the fact that we only meet quarterly and the legislative process can be a fast moving process, we would want to give our EO um, authority to work with the sponsors and the legislator's office at, if the bill is moving forward to address some of these concerns. So with that, I will turn it over to any questions from the board, and then of course we will have um, public comment as well. Uh, I think that 
sponsors. You would like them first? first. Okay. Microphone. That's yep. up to if D wants to do that. I'll move to that. Thank you for the opportunity. Vanessa Kahina, hello, uh, here on behalf of the hearing health care providers. Right off the bat, I do want to indicate that the elimination of calibration for the audiometer was a mistake by the Legislative Council, so that was not intended to be taken out of the bill. Uh, Joe has pointed this out to us numerous times, and we are working on amendments to fix that. In terms of introducing the concept of the apprentice concept in California, um, I don't think that we are married to having a separate license for it. But because we believe the tympanometry is a critical aspect of treating our clients and our consumers, we have hit a sort of a roadblock in terms of figuring out what training and education might look like in order to be able to do this. We felt that per perhaps looking at having an apprenticeship category, even separate from the trainee category, with a higher level of education and training behind it, might be a way to get there. We're open to suggestions on that, but the goal here is to include tympanometry explicitly because we believe that that is an important aspect of treating the folks that we see. And yeah, thank, uh, second, uh, thank you for letting us uh, clear up a few things. I know I read through that uh, when it came out and I was like, oh gosh. Uh, so yes, no, not, not taking away calibration. In fact, I would feel if this went forward more, we would have more equipment that needed to be kept calibrated because that's what we would need to do. When it comes to tympanometry, uh, our main focus is not uh, more than an ipsilateral screening. We're not looking at doing um, a contralateral. We're not looking at this being something that we're, we're creating any diagnosis for. Uh, the spirit of this is that we can uh, find something earlier on. I mean, we're able to take case history. We're able to do otoscopy to, to examine an ear and say, this is my opinion that this ear looks healthy. Um, that's very subjective. Uh, if you're screening with a, tympa, a tymp <laughs> tympanometer, if I can't say the word right, uh, sorry, um, you may actually see uh, something that points to a red flag and would immediately, uh, with a good, a trained hearing aid dispenser, should say, that's a referral. We can't start the hearing aid process today until we have some sort of medical clearance. Um, it's already done throughout the United States in uh, many distance learning programs that are there. Um, it's actually something that was taught in California for a long time. We have members of the HHP who are wondering where the, t the classes went that once taught us on tympanometry. And uh, they, there's a lot of ambiguity in this by, in the, in the uh, A and B, a, B uh, the, uh, sorry, my uh, B and P codes, <laughs> excuse me, um, to where, uh, People can interpret it one way or the other, and I feel that if we're going to uh, be better for the consumer, I think a trained person um, that passes an exam, and I don't know where it came that the board was supposed to create an exam. Uh, there's exams available uh, through the collegiate level. We have numerous PhD audiologists that have taught these exams in, in uh, tympanometry and would be very happy to perform um, a visual, uh, on ha hands-on type of a test, classes. Uh, as an ACA, uh, uh, I have an audio prosthologist certification that is, is I can advertise as recognized because I've gone through. That's a, a college level course that we are able to take. So we're able to go and get further certification currently. This is, the spirit is that we can get certified, have somebody who knows what they're doing and has taught this already at the collegiate level uh, look at a specific candidate and say, you have the demonstrated the the necessary skills to be able to perform that. Correct. Can, can I just ask you, Joe, sure. in, um, in the language in 2538.10b1, <laughs> that's where it says that the examination approved by the board shall be sufficient to demonstrate proficiency in tympanometry. It says it's sit for a board approved examination. And I would okay. So I think the assumption was that this was going to be a board examination. And I can see where that would be okay. correct. Sorry. If I may, we are open to other ways of doing that that wouldn't have a financial impact on the board. Uh, frequently, and I think many of you know this, when you're preparing a bill for introduction, then there's another party that writes the language. So this is the way that they've interpreted it so far in terms of what the operations would look like on implementation, but we're open to other suggestions. 
I just want to clarify for no, I appreciate I appreciate that. That's exactly the section that uh, I was referring to in that. Um, and like I, to reiterate, we board certification, we have to wait two years before we can take the National Board for Certification uh, testing. And we we're able to advertise that as, as a board certified hearing instrument specialist because it, it is within what we do. And all of the curriculum around that includes tympanometry. Yeah, we're, so we're, we're actually expected to know um, how to, to look at at least the tympanogram and make a determination of it. And in fact, the board has done, uh, uh, we've had CEUs available as of September of last year uh, at the IHS convention in tympanometry. So it's something that's repeatedly done in CEUs um, for us to just uh, not diagnose anything. That's not what this is about but to simply add a screening technique to those that have been trained in doing it. So the question that I have Shoot. is just simply, what does tympanometry have to do with the fitting and selling of a hearing aid? So well, if we just simply break it down to the fitting and selling of a hearing aid, explain to me how tympanometry is gonna help a hearing aid dispenser better perform their job. Actually, it starts out because we're, we, we have to do a case history to begin with to make sure somebody's a candidate, find out where they've come from. Um, we're, we have to determine if they've been taking ototoxic medication, and if, if we're, we have to know when we're going to, before we start doing audiometry, the selling process happens after you've done all of the, the testing. So, if, and only after referral has been uh, uh, weeded out. So, it means that fitting and selling a hearing aid on somebody who's a, a, a qualified candidate um, on all aspects that doesn't have some sort of pathology that needs medical attention ahead of time. People sign a waiver if you go through and you don't see anything wrong according to your, to your eye. Subjectively, this is an objective test that points directly to something amiss. And again, in, it's not in our any way to diagnose, but you can't fit or sell a hearing aid on somebody who shouldn't be fit or sell a hearing aid. Correct. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing air, um, pure tone audiometry and there's an air bone gap, mm -hmm. you're gonna, uh, they're going to require medical clearance regardless of if the tympanometry is positive or negative. You're right. And you're subjected to the placement of the bone conduction oscillator. You're also subjected to the thickness of the skin, the, the mastoid area. Somebody, you can get a, a, a false non-air bone gap on somebody where you could also show a type B temp on that person. So uh, there's... I think the, the harm in doing it is very, very low, and we're not asking that this is something that comes out of the gate on a licensed person, but that licensed person has shown that they have uh, passed the tests that this board has created for them to have a minimum competency to make a subjective decision about somebody's ears. We're asking for someone to then be able to get trained to, to run a sc simple screening because as you've been in the, I've been doing this 17 years myself, when you've been here long enough and you see you've done enough CEUs that shows the value of tympanometry, uh, you're thinking, why can't I perform that? Because it's not the performance. So I see you have another question. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, so I just want clarification. So you're thinking that it would help um, confirm whether it's a, a, correct, a negative or false air bone gap? Is correct. It, 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 and uh, again, when we're looking down at, at an ear canal and we don't know the volumes of that ear canal, um, I mean, I make ear, ear impressions uh, pair, right down on top of a, a, someone's uh, a tympanic membrane. I put more pressure on that than even a, a temp, like, like tympanometry might do. Um, so we're expected to know the ear canal in and out, mm -hmm. but the test itself we're not able to run that is far less invasive than even the otoscope tip poking down in someone's ear canal. So. Oh, what you just said. oh, sorry. <laughs> Tympanometry tips are soft. Yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> you put a noto tip down someone's ear, maybe even deeper it's than. Less harmful. That's harmful, exactly right. Then, and we're we're allowed to go right down in there as far as we can. We're putting we're putting stuff down in people's ears because we've shown that we have the competency to do that. Uh, we want to just be able to show that we have the competency to place a temp tympanometer to someone's ear and screen it for an ipsilateral tip. That's what we want to be able to show. And if it shows a type B, we should be we should be referring. There's no question, there's no reason someone should get a hearing aid with a type B temp without medical clearance. So when you say that tip is up against the wall. Yeah. Well, and that's, again, if, if it's a, you can't get a false, you're gonna get, you're gonna get less false positives with a tympanogram. It, it, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that you're gonna get a lot less false type A's than you'll get type B's or, or, or changes in the size of shape. But you also see volume if it's up against the wall, you're gonna get a low volume. And this is training in temp, right? So 
Uh, but you're also going to look down an ear and uh, subjectively make a decision, and that person might have otosclerosis, but you don't know until you've done all of your testing and you have an ear bone gap and you send them on to the, to the next level. I, I think that the, the harm is extremely low compared to the value of a, a dispenser that's trained in doing this to be able to do it. Well, unless you've done a few thousand of them, I don't think you can make that claim um, that there's no harm. And if you you know, the mm -hmm. dispensers have not been allowed to do it, except in the past when they were doing it probably in an unauthorized way. Um, you can do damage. Um, you can place that erroneously. You can push it down the ear canal. You can impact the wax. You can push in. Uh, if they have a lesion in the ear canal, you can scrape right past it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are... Uh, there's the similar dangers in impression that, taking, yeah. though. There's similar dangers in impression taking. I mean, actually, it, you know, there's... Uh, this is something where, um, you know, with a proper case history, knowing that there's, whether someone has a recent perf, you know, there's all the things that, that we're already trained to do. They're already in our scope of practice. Already, we're expected to know these things when we come out of our licensure. It's in our uh, written study guide. It's in our practicum study guide to knowledge of these things. You can't then say we have no qualification to make a decision and treat an ear correctly. It doesn't really, it's not logical that knowledge way. Knowledge of something is completely different than actually being able to perform that. But you, well, when it comes to, again, what I'm trying to say, with all absolute, every bit of respect, is you, when you give us a license, you're saying we're qualified to perform that. That's what you're saying to us. And that otherwise, why would you, we, there's already been a border to say you have this to do. You give us a license because we packed it, pra, pass our written and our practicum. Only thing that happens on top of that is further training that we all get after a two year period. We can get further and further things, but, but you get good at it after a while. Doesn't include Tephanometry, which is well, I'm talking about performance of, of sorry, you, you are correct. You are, I apologize in, in, in that. Um, I, I just want to say, mm -hmm. um, admittance testing, tephanometry, it is diagnostic testing. It is part of a comprehensive case, a comprehensive test battery, and you're not just looking at the middle ear function or whether or not there's positive, negative pressure or large ear canal. You're looking at that in addition to the entire test, your case history, all of it. So you're looking at a big picture, not just this one small piece. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, if we're talking about simply fitting and selling a hearing aid, which is what a hearing aid dispenser is licensed to do, um, and we know that there's an air bone gap they, that requires medical evaluation, tympanometry, I don't understand how that's gonna allow you to better perform your job when you're gonna need to put in a referral, whether it's normal or abnormal. Yep. We are licensed to take case history. It's in our stuff as well, too. And so all of these sense. things are part of our scope. And at every, if, if we're dealing with an adult with ears and hearing, we need to, uh, audiology or hearing aid dispensing kind of overlaps in how that person needs to be treated. And this is something that, again, ipsilaterally is not a full temp. We're talking about the word screening being in this because it's not meant, a screening, uh, and, and Dr. Diaz, you definitely correct me, I'm not sure if you diagnose off of screenings per se of any type. It's usually done, someone that is a diagnostician will do a further further test. We're asking to be able to refer for that sort of thing if a red flag pops up, which we're licensed to look for red flags other than tympanometry at this sure. point in time right now. Which would be an air bone gap in, that, in the case There's a litany, there's a litany of red flags, as as yeah. case history, I would expect everybody to take case history because um, that's part of your hearing aid consultation and mm -hmm. helping determine what's gonna be the appropriate recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, going back to tympanometry, the, the reasoning behind it is to help identify why there's a air bone gap and that wouldn't be the job of a hearing aid dispenser. It's, there's an air bone gap, you need medical attention. It, again, whether it's uh, normal or abnormal, I, don't, mm -hmm. I just don't see how that fits into the fitting or selling of a hearing aid. I appreciate your, yeah. ear canal, you know, observation is one thing. Changing pressure in an ear canal is um, potentially dangerous. I mean, you're going from very positive, very negative pressure. Mm -hmm. um, some people can't handle it at all. Mm -hmm. um, that you're doing that to them, but it, I think it has to be in the hands of somebody who's highly trained and not somebody who takes a weekend course or some little thing out there to learn how to do it. And to be, again, with every bit of respect, uh, we've been talking to PhD level audiologists that teach this and they, they disagree with that specific statement, very reputable ones. So that's why we're talking about these courses that's being like done. Saying, you know, the other kids are doing it, Dad. No, I'm trying to say that people in your own profession that are at a PhD level that teach this feel that that's an inaccurate statement. Well, so that's what I'm trying to say. You've got to bring them in. 
Well, that's what our hearing is for, that is to work with this. But and this is what we're, this is to answer questions here as well, too, uh, and make sure that we all have our opinions on the table. But we have to deal with fact, not, not always fear. We have to deal with facts, too. So that's what I'm, and I'm, so I'm trying to present at least what I know. Uh, we are already able to seek out further certification, and our further certification includes tympanometry in our testing uh, nationally. So why can it not be a further certification when it comes to a screening in tympanometry in California? That's my, my argument. I'd love to take a question on this. I have an administrative <laughs> question regarding, <laughs> so you can answer me all. Uh, what's the difference between apprentice hearing a dispenser license to a trainee license? There would be, I think, somewhat more hands-on training um, in the apprenticeship license. It's essentially codifying what International Hearing Society presented as their apprenticeship program. We don't actually need to put it into statute in California to be able to do it. No, but practically, it would be identical for someone to apply for a trainee license or apprentice license. Mm -hmm. can, I, I can I add yeah. on yeah. to? Um, in your binder, um, so uh, actually let me back up. Yeah. In the law, um, they are referencing the International Hearing Society's Distance Learning for Professionals in Hearing Health Sciences course. And in your binder, um, if you, there's each thing is divided by a blue page. Yeah. If you flip back, I did include some course materials, just an outline of what the course materials are about, an outline. And then behind that is information about the International Hearing Society Apprenticeship Standards. Heather, can you tell us no, which no, tab? So oh, sorry, we're 4G. in 4G. 4G. I'm looking, I'm, I'm saying like this. There will be a hearing a dispenser license, apprentice hearing a dispenser license, and a trainee license, three categories? So the way the apprentice license works, it, it, the way it comes from is the this SAA, the State Apprentice Association, um, it's already a title and a curriculum is created. And it's mainly a structured training program. It's not imperative that it is listed as a new category. Someone uh, currently could get be, be an apprentice and apply for a training license and be under the training guises. No, but it says it I, I'm create. saying currently, you're reading the bill. I'm saying currently, as of today, we can do, we can, we don't have to have the apprentice written in there for yeah, that. But, so why do we need to a bill to create a new category? We wanted to have at least something going into this discussion that would demonstrate that there is a written curriculum and practice guides available that have been approved by Federal Department of Labor. How yeah. do you do distance learning for these, for like a, a tympanometry and ear impressions? How do they do it? Uh, this is, it's hands-on. This wouldn't be distance. This is a... The, and the apprenticeship is a combination between hands-on and the... What you're proposing. And the online distance learning. Yeah. The current apprenticeship program approved by IHS and the Department of Labor is meant to be hands-on, like journeyman apprentice, much like a contractor would, you know, you're not performing a task unless you are on site working with so that. you do this distance learning That's course correct. with someone here. That's well, correct. That's exactly the, but and cur currently, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it, well, actually, you can ask a question. Yeah. <laughs> if, if this bill pass as you want it or as it's written here, mm -hmm. and you go to one office and there is a trainee license on the wall, and he's a trainee, and his supervisor is there, and he can do fit and sell hearing aid while his supervisor is here. Mm -hmm. And you go to another office and there is an apprentice license, and this is the apprentice and this is the supervisor. What's the difference between these two? I don't believe there's any difference at that point. I think I see what you're getting at, and I appreciate that point, because we're, we're trying to land in a place right now that helps us get to a few more things that HHP wants to perform. Having the apprenticeship component of the bill helped us get to some of those educational components that are, you know, candidly completely missing from our license category. So this is an attempt. It's a discussion. Uh, many bills happen in a discussion process like this, as messy as it is, but we've been having this discussion here in front of this board for some years now, and this was a new idea on how to try to land something. But and 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 Mr. Shalev, I also I think that we are open to 
either differentiating those further. Um, I, I don't know that we want to get to an advanced practice license on this, but I think that it's important that we at least be able to work in some sort of educational training program that doesn't really currently exist. Yeah, but can't you incorporate this educational program with the trainee license Theoretically, today we without could. The, but the I, a new category? I, I, correct. No, I, I agree. We do not need to have a new wow. license type necessarily. But in terms of incorporating the existing IHS language on this, that was where we started. Yeah. And with regarding to TIMP, I don't know if we solved the problem there because you have a meeting in uh, 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 the, the committee meeting in April. 23rd? The 23rd, correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that Vanessa will be there, and I'm sure your Vanessa will be there, mm -hmm. and the fight will be there, and yeah. whatever the committee <laughs> yeah. will decide. And yeah. I also will mention that we have a stakeholder meeting coming up next week. We're unable to schedule it prior to this because the way that the legislature has been moving so quickly in the past month, but we have a stakeholder meeting coming up next week to continue to attempt to negotiate. Yeah. And now, if, if this will come, if, if the committee will say, yeah, the Spencer can do team, team then it will create, there will be a group of dispensers that don't do team. Correct. And there will be a group of dispensers that do team. And how is the board going to serve, a, start giving two different licenses? No, nope, it would be, uh, like currently we have greater, we have certification. Uh, currently we have certifications on top of our license, I imagine, uh, again, the, the language would have to be specifically done that way, but we're allowed to have an additional certification on top of our license that the board is, is, a, is I don't know that's work a, that the staff can say and legal can say if how, how what's the definition of hearing a dispenser? Hearing a, this hearing a dispenser can, I mean, can mm -hmm. do TIMP or not? I mean, what's the definition? At this point in time, it, it, when it comes to what is to go into the bill and just say every licensed hearing aid dispenser can do tympanometry, I think would be, uh, there's a lot more to it to work with that. That would require occupational analysis. Sure. There would be lots of things that happen where um, if we have a population of hearing aid dispensers that are performing tympanometry and it ends up in an occupational analysis that we are performing no. tympanometry screening, then eventually you might see a board. So today we have audiologists and we have dispensing audiologists, right? Mm -hmm. We have two categories, mm -hmm. and there will have to be two categories of, of dispenser. Dispensers that don't do team and dispensers that do team. Like uh, two categories that will have, otherwise we will not know I mean, which can do it and which not. You would, but I don't know that that'd be a, uh, I, can, it's not, I don't know if it's, a, it's a, again, a board how can the, designed. The, the, how can the board enforce violation on team for a dispenser if it's not have it mm -hmm. under his scope of the, This uh, is part duties. of the conversation that mm -hmm. we're also hoping to have through the business and professions and, committee. And, and, and there have been, you yeah. know, other mm -hmm. professions that have had other duties added into their profession. For us, because of the way that the license is structured, it's just been very frustrating to try and figure out a way to get to something that we think would help our consumers. And then uh, it will have to be written probably on the law. Uh, this hearing a dispenser allowed to do team, but they're not allowed to diagnose based on this team. We can't diagnose on the team any. We can't diagnose no, at all. No, but it has yeah. to be explicit. Mm -hmm. Uh, that and I believe not, that there's I, already that's language be, in our current be, practice act that the other because tests I, that we use are not diagnostic. Not diagnostic However, yeah. this bill changes that. That is another error. That yes. no concern of mine. That whole section, they just got that very happy with strike throughs. I don't. Correctly it's driving me insane. And, yeah. Because that's yeah. not the issue. That yeah, yeah, yeah. That it would not be a diagnostic. Okay. And then the yeah. staff of the board has to show how much it will cost the board to go and have create another category how to administer this. I had a few questions. Mm -hmm. So um, so how, how many hearing aid dispensers are doing tympanometry right now? I know that when it came to polling our membership, um, it, the desire was, and this is not, I, I'm gonna 
work my way around. I don't have an exact number uh, of those that are doing it because some of them are not saying they're doing it for fear of, of uh, enforcement by the board. Although um, at this point in time, I know that a lot of there's been a, a couple of letters written. Again, I probably can't none of that. that just say cease and desist. I don't know that there's any, been any kind of action against it. But when we pull our own membership, uh, there's about 90% of the, the dispensers that we pulled, I think we have a couple hundred dispensers, um, were favorable of a course that would allow them to perform a tympanometry. It sound, uh, from the conversation, it sounded, mm -hmm. but it sounded like many of you have taken courses and know how to do it and can do it. Though. Yeah, it's okay. once, uh, I, I was speaking to a member out of the Palm Desert recently, and he brought to our attention that HHP used to have it. That has been in the last few days that I haven't had a chance to get back and see the exact test. But I know that, t that uh, continuing education units have been given for decades when it comes to tympanometry. So we've had CEUs in numerous of our conferences and IHS conferences that uh, at least the CEUs in learning about the process. Uh, and uh, I know that across the United States, so this is not just California, but across the United States, uh, they use the ILEE, which is designed by uh, IHS, as their written test. It's accepted as a written test, and it covers uh, tympanometry. Not a practicum, but it's covered on as a, as a premise for hearing aid dispensing licensing. What's the ILEE? It's the independent learning Independent Learning Exam, I-L-E, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, is that like a licensing exam for hearing aid dispensers? It is, is in certain states accept that as their written exam. Okay, so it's, some it, uh, state boards use the I-L-E as the hearing aid dispensers licensing exam, is that right? That is, that is correct. That it, uh, I, could, uh, I, I can get a list of specific states from IHS from it. I believe it's 27, 23 to 27 okay. states. And tympanometry is in the ILE. It is. It's also tested at, like I said, the board certification. When we take our national board certification test, we are tested on uh, different scenarios when it comes to tympanometry. There is no practicum. That's, that there is no practical skills test, but that's what we're looking to make an addition where someone can actually. So the ILE is a written exam. Correct. That is correct. Okay. And then your your. And then there are questions regarding tympanometry uh, on the on the written ILE. That is correct. Uh, so how many state so in how many states are hearing aid dispensers licensed to do tympanometry? It's uh, there. I don't, I'm not sure the exact uh, amount, but when they're doing the ILEE, that would point towards scope of practice. So I'd say somewhere in that similar 20 to 27. I could get an actual number uh, pulled from that as well too. Do we know that? So can, you come to, can you come to the microphone, please? So CAA actually reached out to every state. I'm sorry, can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Carrie Bauer. I'm with CAA. Um, we reached out to every state, and there are two states that allow hearing aid dispensers to do TIMPs, and it's with significant additional training and a minimum of an associate's degree. Can I add something a little different? Um, and so when you say that you've taken courses and you have knowledge of tympanometry and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. so when you, we have the same undergraduate degree, different, um, different um, graduate degrees, but I, so I know a lot, my point is, I've taken courses, you've taken courses in speech, I'm sure you had to take courses in audiology, so I have a, a pretty strong knowledge of speech evaluations, speech sessions and how that works and you have a strong knowledge of how we do our job but we're I'm not doing your job <laughs> and you're not doing we're not doing um, mm -hmm. yeah. each other's jobs is my point so I think try. it's important to have knowledge of what each of our professions entail mm -hmm. and and all of the services that we provide that doesn't mean <clears throat> you should be qualified to be performing something unless it assist in the fitting and selling of a hearing aid? I think that that would absolutely would assist in the fitting and selling of a hearing aid. So because it would assist in re the, the not fitting or selling a hearing aid on someone that need, needs a referral. So if you have an air, a negative air bone gap and then you have a normal temp, what would you do with that patient? If you have, sorry, you have a negative air bone gap and a normal temp, mm -hmm. that'd be a candidate for a hearing aid. So you would just, um, have, would you have them there, Well, there's more, there's case history to that too. You have, there's all sorts of more stuff. Those two things don't make it all. But if I was had a clean case history, somebody who uh, shows with a sensory neural impairment that just is simply 
appears, in my opinion, to be presbycusis and a type A temp, I would say that that person with a waiver signed that they don't want to see a doctor, I wouldn't push them into saying you have to see a physician for that. Um, that's my personal opinion of that scenario. And wouldn't you be able to make that decision without having done the temp? The temp would be really nice to have done that because when it comes to sometimes bone conduction, you can get a shift in that. You can get a, a 10 decibel shift in your calibrated oscillator. If you can see an air bone gap. That's not really an air bone gap. If you use your machine all the time, then you're shifting it down. But that's subjective. We're talking about subjective, subjective, subjective stuff. This is the only addition of a slightly objective reading that might mean a referral versus a sale of a hearing aid. You know, I, I want to make sure that I'm not selling and fitting a hearing aid on somebody who needs a referral that, that uh, all of our st standard stuff isn't necessarily showing that. Do you ever do tuning fork testing? One more time. Tuning fork testing? Uh, I've, bone I've, you can do it like, you know, put it center of the head Burn. down on the back of the ear. Yeah, you can change position of the, I haven't, I don't have a tuning fork around my office though, but no. Uh, okay. uh, I have a question. If a physician will refer to you a patient and ask you to do a team and send him the result, that's... I don't believe that would be part of our scope in that case. It's not because, because I don't think we're doing enough of a temp for him to create a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Only we're screening to say further testing needs to be done. That's what I would personally feel so about So you that. have no objection. If the committee will be favorable to go ahead with it, you will have no problem that part of the law will be specifically said not for diagnostic purposes. Absolutely. I have no problem with that. Currently, we, we don't do any testing for diagnostic purpose right now. However, when I sit in front of an audiometer and, and, the, and the dispensing audiologist sits in front of the audiometer, we are pushing the same buttons and creating a, a, the same pure tone patterns. And at the very end, neither of us can say this is, but it can be what we are, it's significant or it's consistent with what we know in our basic training because some of the overlap between much more, I, I, I won't get into say we're anywhere near the same as an audiologist because I know there's so many things audiologists can do that we cannot do. But when it comes to fitting a hearing aid, we overlap in certain categories. And it's not, it's not our education, it's not our training, but we're sitting down and we're dealing with a, a, a consumer of California that wants to put their trust in their help and their treatment of their hearing. Um, lost my train of thought as to what that question was now. No, that's just a question. Yeah. <laughs> you said what you just said. Yeah. Would you say that your industry would say that you've made a lot of very poor hearing aid fittings because you haven't been able to do tympanometry over the last? No, because it's amazing. That's a great question, actually, because the onset of real ear measurement nowadays has been such a great gold standard and its best practices. Another thing that we're able to do, because it's part of the fitting and selling of a hearing aid, without any training at all. You can start putting tubes down people's ears, and uh, you have no training on, on I mean, you, the only training you get in real measurement is if a rep comes and tells you this is how you do it, or they show you from afar. So that, I don't have bad fittings because I'm not able to do temp. I have great fittings because I use all of the tools at my disposal to do a great hearing aid fitting. So you do real ear. I do real ear. Uh, I, every single person. In industry, you'd say, has adopted that? I've see, I, I see it in multiple online forums, uh, hearing dispensers and audiologists alike that are using best practices. That's right there as something that they use. All of, I have four locations and all of them have real or measurement. Every one of my, my people are trained to do it and are required to do it in the first two appointments of any kind of a fitting. That would be an interesting survey because I just have a feeling that there's not there very many out there doing it. So. You know, if they want to stay in business very long with the... Uh, it's yeah. <laughs> and I just want to add that uh, a lot of times if you have a false air bone gap, Let's say you do have, nor you're able to perform tympanometry and you do have a normal tympanogram. Um, a lot of times it's just either uh, the insert's coming loose or you're, you've collapsed the canal with the improper placement of the TDH headphones. Mm -hmm. So simply using a bone oscillator to test if there's a positive Weber can also signal if it's a false air bone gap. Mm -hmm. um, and then just going in and repositioning headphones. I mean, I, that is having... Your air bone um, results accurate is going to be what's most important in the fitting and selling of hearing aids. It's a great point, and yet there is a, something available called tympanometry screening that's very quick and very something that doesn't take long that just adds another avenue than a pure tone test into the whole system.
<laughs> that you think honestly. The last time this came up, I, I went to a number of um, audiometry manufacturers, audiometer manufacturers, mm -hmm. and asked them how how comfortable were they with their development of their bone, bone oscillators in terms of being calibratable and maintaining calibration, mm -hmm. how reliable they were. And to of course, they're going to tell me that. But I also talked to a lot of calibration people, and they didn't say that bone conduction is such a flaky operation that you can't trust it and things like that. Nobody would support that notion. And yet, I have, I, when I come, when I've, I've done perfect placement and I can still at 1,000 hertz end up plus or minus 10 and I have colleagues that same same thing will have, again, it's one frequency out of the three for referral. So I, I they're, of course they're going to tell you their stuff doesn't get, doesn't mess up, they want to sell their stuff. But in the actual practical application, I'm, I, I mean, you guys are all audiologists and it sounds like it's never happened to you that you place an oscillator on the back of an ear and felt that the gap was odd for the for the person's loss uh but you know yeah we all we all have again so that, that it's not saying everybody's oscillators are wrong but it's saying it's not a perfect way to determine the mechanical function of the middle ear yeah i mean yeah my my comment was just going to be that I, I trust air conduction and bone conduction far more than I trust tympanometry. And mm -hmm. tympanometry has led me astray far more. Than, <laughs> um, it's the, the tympanogram, the tympanogram has got me confused. I can't tell you how many more, how many times. So, I mean, if if you sent me tympanograms with every patient, I would probably get more confused than. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, I just, I had three patients this week where the tympanogram was wrong. Um, and it wasn't me for you, it was my audiologist. But they're good audiologists, they're really good audiologists. We, we can probably argue this all day, but yes. I'm just, just saying, we're not trying to change the license tonight after all. Correct. Um, we hope to get more training. Hold on, Marcia, I think Rod's still... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, the, Well, uh, um, it, so it says that there's uh, uh, there's going to be distance training and and so on and courses, but the the number of hours for the courses isn't specified. That's still under debate. That's still being. Is that within the the the? the what I understand the apprenticeship program is a. It's currently listed as a two-year program. Uh, that you, distance training is the two distance years? training is a two-year program. So uh, that's longer than the apprenticeship. Correct. It can be completed sooner than, uh, but uh, they they list it as no no longer than uh, than a two-year program to have that done. They're in, they're dealing with again multiple states when it comes to that and multiple state licensing and our specific uh, training license requirements of 18 months is is not the norm across the United States, but it's what we have and has been very significant for us. So it could easily be adapted uh, similarly when it comes to this. And that's the only course currently that is required to be taken in the apprenticeship program. It's actually the apprenticeship program is structured with a trainer program and a, a, a trainee or apprentice so there's two things so yes it's a right. very very but that, specific but that's course. the only required course that, that's, that's correct to, that is and correct. then yeah. the apprentice sponsor can have up to three apprentices at a time so but there's no mention of mm -hmm. the we're getting into immediate mm -hmm. and direct and indirect right so correct. that's not that's not been hashed out either correct. so that's you're correct and that's uh, i think that's piggybacking off of some of the same language in our training side of it uh that you know a, a hearing aid dispenser can have more than one trainee but there's all sorts of things that we've already gotten in place for what a hearing aid dispenser has to do to have a trainee and also the approvals by the board to have an extra trainee as well so that's some language i think that would need some clarification and uh, definitely. So is that going to be, is that going to be specified before the, the bill is, is finalized? I'm not sure what amendments have already gone through. Yeah, we had amendments go through yesterday. Many so things like are the moving flux, target. given <laughs> the stakeholder conversations that are going mm -hmm. on. But if the board is able to identify a number of factors, you know, either one, with elimination of a new license type, but then two, either bolstering and perhaps expediting the trainee regulations that we formulated here and having aspects of this that could go into that, that could be part of the amendments process. We're open to the conversation. I, I have a question. Um, so I'm a public member. I'm not an audiologist or a speech bubble or anything else. But um, number one, what brought about this bill? 
And then um, number two, it's obvious from these conversations that this bill currently isn't ideal for you guys and it's not ideal for us. So what is your ideal of this? Like, if all the amendments were put through, what would be your ideal for this bill? And then also, what brought about this right. bill? I believe it was some time ago, hearing aid dispensers didn't necessarily have a prohibition on doing tympanometry. But there was an opinion um, issued by the DOJ 15, 20 years ago. I don't even think it was the DOJ. No, it wasn't. It was an independent person. Anyhow, um, out of an abundance of caution, most hearing aid dispensers would tell you that they don't perform tympanometry, though there is sentiment within the profession amongst HHP members that they believe that it would help their clients if they could perform it. Um, that's where we want to land. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Mm -hmm. The apprenticeship piece was added because the way that our license type is written is that you know we don't need anything above a high school education, sitting for the written exam and passing the practical. So there is no education that has been mentioned that we could use in order to demonstrate that we could perform this safely. So adding the apprenticeship piece was a concept we had to get a conversation going. It doesn't need to stay in there. So your ideal would be we want to perform tympanometry, right? Uh, my next question, since I'm not an audiologist, what is tympanometry? Okay, so tympanometry is a measurement of the mechanical function of the middle ear. So how do you measure that here? You use pressure on the a, 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 tymp a tympanogram is basically it shows positive and negative pressure on a chart, and a healthy ear should have equal pressure on each side of the okay. eardrum. And so if you have a tympanogram that shows there's 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 a type A, type B, and type C, it shows different uh, slopes, and that would mean that pressure differences happen in the middle ear versus the outer ear portion of someone, someone's ear. If the pressure difference is there, often it could point to uh, otitis media, or uh, I just use that as an example, uh, otosclerosis, numerous pathologies that would require uh, further, um, further testing uh, at the ENT or MD level to, to determine what's wrong with the, with the ear. Uh, type A temp with equal pressures on both sides, again, I, I, you know, I, I def definitely take your, take your reservation in as to someone didn't do it correctly, but a type A temp generally would say that that ear does not have any pathologies in combination with other testing that we do. We can form an opinion that that person could potentially be a candidate for a hearing aid. <coughs> that we've abandoned this type A, B, and C probably 20 years ago. Uh, we don't use those terminology anymore. We don't even measure the entire tympanogram. Um, we're looking so it's a different test altogether we're going to do that. It's great. <laughs> if you really want to know how the middle yeah. is functioning, yeah. um, you kind of need to get with the newer ways that we're doing it. Uh, so we're looking at, at peak Y, we're looking at um, uh, the width, we're looking at a lot of things besides the tympanogram. It's kind of passe. I think that that actually is a great example is why it's something that is, it's not even something that audiology does, but in our training, again, some of the things go back, well, I mean, my written test I took 17 years ago, there was tympanometry on my written test uh, because it's been on our written test. It was taken off after the opinion piece came through that it was not in our scope of practice. So if, if a tympanometry screening makes us feel better about our personal tests, then I don't see any kind of harm in it if you're doing a fully different test now at, the, at your level too. Tests, we're just doing different measures. Mm -hmm. It's the same operation. It's, well, ipsil, we're doing ipsil, I mean, ipsilateral, just single ear at any, at any given time. And that's the, the current way that it's still being taught or in, in the CE uh, courses that we're getting, that's the main focus because it is tympanometry for beginners in a sense. The better measures is my point I'm making. Mm -hmm. The audiology community has moved on to more discrete measures, more mm -hmm. accurate uh, depiction of middle ear function, than, and that's kind of an old fashioned way to do it anymore. What equipment are you using to do that? Then? The same. We use the oh, same, okay. but we have um, more, the circuitry is more sophisticated, yeah. so it shows us a number of different measures beyond simply what the tympanogram shape looks like. Right. Well, when it comes to, again, ipsilateral tympanometry with the newest I don't equipment. Know why you say 
One ear, one ear, not yeah, contralateral. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, it's well, that's what I'm saying. Tip when I say tip screening, you could start throwing because again, hearing screening is so very, very, very open. It, 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 you know, it should be one frequency across the, the way. That's a screening. When people say I'm doing a hearing screening, they perform a whole hearing test. So when I say tympanometry, I'm trying to mean tympanometry screening. I'm talking about one ear, not reflexes, not contralateral. We're not doing ABRs. We're not doing all that stuff. It's just simply again a quick. Verification test on our, our part of it. So, yeah. I, I have a question. Is, is the law today does not prohibit dispenser from doing tympanometry if it's not then diagnostic? Uh, but what's the law system? So I would have to do a little bit in depth. My, my gut feeling. You said that the law not. does not prohibit it's, that. It does not. It says we can't perform a diagnostic test, but a screening is not a diagnostic test in any, in any yeah, way. But facet, it, yeah, but it does not. And, the board relies only on somebody who sent a letter 15 years ago. Let's tackle, maybe we can tackle the letter and, and find, hey, you can do it. If the board will vote on that, that's an awesome I thing. Mean, we can avoid this board, bill. But no, I don't no, think. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you, you can find the letter, find mm -hmm. who's done it. Oh, yeah. And this, and this person or agency that's done it, try to reverse their opinion. Absolutely. Well, yeah. But that, that, that's all exists yeah, to be able to uh, do. Maybe it will be easier for you. Mm -hmm. So as someone who does not, I, hmm. has never performed tympanometry, um, I would have to really understand more what that entails. I can't just go off of that it's not diagnostic. Right. The law currently says that um, it shall not conduct diagnostic hearing tests when conducting tests in connection with the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. I, I do ask one question. Mm -hmm. What would you determine as a difference between a diagnostic hearing test and the hearing test that we do? I, I, I just, out of the board in, in general, what's the difference between the two tests? So I would have to look at what, okay. I, I don't have so that my, personal knowledge. The board might be able to present me with that because I've been you're, trying to say the same thing. Well, you're basically screening for the purposes of a hearing aid fitting. So you're, you're needing to find air bone thresholds and fit to that accordingly. Right, so we're screen, it's more of a screening that we can fit a hearing aid off of. So it's not a diagnostic test. So we can perform screenings, we can't perform uh, a a diagnostic radiogram. hearing tests, yeah. So that, that's the difference and, in that. And yeah. that's where I That's where the ambiguity go, lies, and I appreciate you. And I go too. right back to when trying to decide if tympanometry would benefit patients being fit by hearing aids, or with hearing aids by a hearing aid dispenser, um, what does that add to the airbone thresholds that you're fitting a hearing aid to? There's the, the PhD uh, audiologist I've worked with recently, Ted Venema, he actually likens it to the three parts of a tripod. You know, there's three things that together give you a good picture of what's, what's going on in the very initial portion you're working with the patient. Um, I've, I've been to an ear, nose, and throat doctor's office recently, and I did, I've done a few different interviews to try and figure this out. Often it's said that people do TIMPs after finding an air bone gap. I don't believe that's what we're looking to do because that would be, again, once you find, it, find an air bone gap, that's what we'd be looking to do it before we even do the, the testing, just as part of our own regimen to make sure that we're going into, if you have a type A TIMP and you get, you start doing your testing, you're probably going to see more likely sensory neural type of impairments on the on the, the beginning side of it. If it's done as the diagnostic, it's usually, uh, or it's avoided because of billing. We aren't gonna be billing for it. There's nothing we can bill for it. People avoid it to, to add extra testing to somebody for billing. In our case, we're, like I said, it, it's seen by our, by many to be valuable for the be beginning of, of the process. So I think if you, um as a part of answering your question, if I were to look at it um, and conduct this analysis, I would also be looking at 2538.36, which is about the consultation recommendation and when that can occur. And um, there it says, whenever any of the following conditions are found to exist either from observations by the licensee or on the basis of information furnished by the prospective hearing aids user, so the case history, right, mm -hmm. um, you shall, uh, put it in writing and submit, and then it, it lists the different things. So I'd have to take a look to, as to tipinometry, mm -hmm. whether or not that's an observation, mm -hmm. um, or whether or not that's would be more than an observation, and whether or not it falls into these categories of things listed mm -hmm. um, in, in making that determination. So I think that's just another piece of the I puzzle. I appreciate that thought that, sideways, another angle to 
make sure ultimately the ambiguity I, I know for our specific membership of, of members who have performed temp received cease and desist letters and it, it can look like and more to harassment than it can be any teeth because there's nothing in the law that specifically says this debate has been obviously decades who long of this exact thing. Well, let me, let me just clarify. If I well, could, I, I could yeah. clarify the, the letters that I think you're referring to because mm -hmm. we've had this conversation before. Yeah. Whenever a hearing dispenser advertises that they perform um, practices that are outside of their scope, which has to do with um, fitting and selling hearing aids, we will send a cease and desist letter. Mm -hmm. We don't have to. We can cite. We have authority to cite a person for mm -hmm. for engaging in false advertising. Or if someone says that they have an audiologist on staff and they don't, then we send a cease and desist letter. So I think the cease and desist letter is to say you can't advertise that you practice tympanometry when it's not within your scope of practice. This specific case was not advertising that was sent based upon it. We, I don't know if we're, well, we're talking it. about the practice of tympanometry though, right? We're talking about, yes, the practice of okay. tympanometry. Exactly so right. someone, yeah, yeah. if we know that someone is practicing tympanometry mm -hmm. or advertising the practice of tympanometry, mm -hmm. we will send them either a cease and desist letter or we will cite them. Mm -hmm. And what we have been doing, and the only cases that I'm aware of off the top of my head are those that have to do with that involve advertising because mm -hmm. we respond to every consumer complaint and if we get a complaint that that's yeah. where it goes and that basis is on the fact that tipponometry has been seen as a diagnostic tool yeah i think uh, my personal opinion would think it'd be silly to advertise because again it's not something people really well i would i would defer to the experts as to why tipponometry is seen as a diagnostic tool. Not as seen, uh, we know what is seen, but I want in writing in the law, where does it say tympanometry is a diagnostic test? So it's an interpretation. Yeah, I don't, so I, don't think that, I don't think that the law defines all medical definitions, but we have other resources that we would go to. And, and maybe I'll let, you know, Rod, do you want to answer that? Well, I mean, it's used to help make a diagnosis. So when, when you have, when you perform audiometry, audiometry can be used as a diagnostic tool. But it can also be used as a hearing aid fitting tool. Yes. You don't have to use the audiogram so to make it, a diagnosis. You can use the audiogram to help fit a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. And that's what a hearing aid dispenser uses an audiogram for. But an ENT or an audiologist can use an audiogram to make a diagnosis. But they can also, but a tympanogram isn't used to fit a hearing aid. A uh, tympanogram is, is, is one bit of information that in conjunction with the audiogram is used to help make a diagnosis. But like I just said, most of the time it's, yeah. <laughs> it confounds making the diagnosis yeah. because it just makes things more confusing. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, I, I don't see how it's used to help fit a hearing aid. It's used to help make a diagnosis for what's going on in the middle ear, but more and more often these days, it's used to help make a diagnosis of what's going on in the inner ear, which is yeah. why it's so confusing. No, I know, some, but some, some claim that it helps them to make better fitting. I'm, I'm not that, sure how. I, uh, I how, don't how know, I mean, otherwise, because I don't think yeah, that I'm you will fit, sure. you will sell so if more I, hearing aids it, if you have this versus if you don't have it. Um, it's not going to change the sale amounts. As a practical standpoint, I do want to say that I did look up okay. what the bill currently says as of today, and it it does narrow it. So let me find it again. Tell um, me they took away that stupid calibration thing. Yeah. They have not, I don't think. Um, they all, no, no, it's like total strike through. Um, Good. Yeah. But that wasn't us. Okay, a licensed. <laughs> okay, so for purposes of this section, tympanometry means the administration of the test for the sole purposes of fitting and maintaining hearing aids or referring a patient to a specialist physician and surgeon. So the, that's how it's currently written in its updated version. But I can't think of uh, in, I can't think of a, a, a time when you would have an abnormal tympanogram but a normal audiogram. Yeah. So, you know, if I could go back to answer. Oh, yeah, if you didn't get a if you didn't get a seal, like you would get. I, yeah. I want to. Can I just 
respond to that really quickly? Mm -hmm. It's just like you said, you got three tips that were confusing this past week. That's hell. Yeah. <laughs> because you have to look at the whole picture. And I think my mm -hmm. biggest concern would be if um, you guys are using that to determine whether or not you should refer, that's a concern because they, you could easily get an inaccurate temp anagram. So but we already have the indications for referral, and I think exactly. that there, there, if there's are, an error gap, we have reasonably good indications. We have those 15 indications yes. for referral. Those indications have been there a long, long time. My my, my family's been for 43 years licensing, and those indications have been there. Uh, I think back then, tympanometry was probably done out of a dump truck sized machine where now things, you know, there is better, there is better stuff nowadays that wasn't available then. I would uh, disagree with that. And handheld tympanometry is something that we now have more access to. It's in a price range where we can work with it. It's something that is, oh, there's FDA approval on one that specifically says hearing aid dispensers on it. So I, I, think, I, I think that list is pretty good. I, the, the list is comprehensive. Um, audiology hasn't changed that much. The audiogram is still the audiogram. But technology it's has it's changed, what I'm trying to say. Anagram, except now you can, yes, you can get an emittance bridge that's handheld. Mm -hmm. It's still measuring the same thing. So mm -hmm. I, you, we, that's, I, I think that's you, a null if, argument. If you have, I think if you pick any, any, any time you're going to have an abnormal tip pentagram, you're going to have at least one of those things on the list. Right. You, you got it. Yeah, that's exactly right. You are. Sorry. Gotcha. Yep. I think some smart people like made that. up that list. <laughs> Over time. Maybe not one person. Maybe <laughs> several people. Is, is this can cause false referrals? I, I believe it's the opposite side of it is people that that are not maybe getting referred because they're not seeing none of those things are showing as an indication, um, it, and it's just one more in, tool in, when it comes to uh, determining that person's the way their ear is working when it comes to working with a hearing aid. So. I'm sorry, I have to leave. So I just wanted to say a couple of things from CA before I have to take off. Um, we just wanted to let you guys know that obviously CA opposes this bill. We have letters in opposition from CASHA, AAA, and ADA as well. And at last count, we had 75 individual audiologist letters from the state of California who are all licensed under you that oppose the bill as well. What a surprise. <laughs> what a surprise, I know. I'm sure most of them say it's not a diagnostic test, which is again, that's hard. Sorry. <laughs> um, if the board would like, I do have just a couple of, um, not on the sort of core of the bill, but some of the more um, features of the bill that I think have a legal consequence. Um, and some of these, I think, can be remedied by board regulation, but I do want to just call your attention to them. Um, so the first is, as we've mentioned, um, the, the calibration, um, that being removed, as well as um, a licensed hearing aid dispenser shall not conduct a diagnostic hearing tests when conducting tests in connection with the practice and fitting of selling of hearing aids. Um, my understanding is that there are other diagnostic testings other than tipinometry, whether or not that's a diagnostic testing or not, but that could be of concern if that language is removed. Um, my question here was that, so I understand that there are tests that do test tympanometry. Is that right? Um, because that was my other thing is that it would be a large undertaking to create an examination. And not only creating an examination, if there is an examination that already exists, the board would have a duty still to ensure that that test um, is sufficient to make sure that the person is proficient in tympanometry. Absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, so there wouldn't be no work on the board side, I guess is what I'm saying. If, if, mm -hmm. there, if there is a test that exists, the board still would have a duty to ensure that that test meets our standards. Um, in 2538.58A, um, it says an apprentice hearing aid dispenser license authorizes license holder to engage in the practice of dispensing. Um, that's not consistent with other language within your practice act. There, mm -hmm. The practice of dispensing isn't defined, it's the practice of fitting and selling hearing aids. Can you repeat the specific code section? 2538.58A. 0.58A? A. A. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it might have changed, I don't know, but it's a, it's um, it's the trainee, or not the trainee, the um, 
apprentice hearing uh, a dispenser and it says that they're able to engage in the practice of dispensing. Mm -hmm. um, but your, your practice act says and defines fitting or selling of hearing aids. Okay. Um, in that same section in B, the sponsor only needs to hold a valid license for three years, but um, in many cases, we, the board um, wants that license to be uh, free of discipline. Okay. So that's something that can be done by regulation. Again, mm -hmm. some of these can be um, alleviated by regulations, but just to call your attention to some of the gaps that mm -hmm. I see. That's great, actually. Thank you. Um, and then, um, so in the differences between the apprenticeship and the trainee currently, so right now there is um, language about the trainee and how many times it can be renewed and for how long what happens if you don't take if you don't pass the practical examination mm -hmm. here there is a difference um, it's an it's it's the, the as I read the language it's an 18th month course you take the practical and written exams and after you do that you still have to be an apprentice um, yeah, I was wondering that language months. myself for that specific part of it because when I spoke with um, our, the IHS legal, uh, what is Alyssa? She's the. She's their government affairs. Government affairs director. Affairs director. Um, that was not necessarily the the idea that they stay on as a apprentice after they've passed all of their testing. That's I mean I think we all would agree that's sign of kind of. Right, that seems Weird. to be that yeah. you would rather yeah. be a trainee yeah. at that point right. than an yeah. apprentice. So I, I can see how that might. The, the spirit of what they were doing is that ultimately the apprentice is under all the same guidelines as a trainee. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we're kind of coming back and forth as to where where this has to be in the bill. Or there may even be just another language in the bill that ratifies this uh, versus creating an additional position uh, mm -hmm. for it. But uh, an apprentice has to be a trainee. A trainee doesn't have to be an apprentice mm -hmm. is the way that that, that basically works. Because you could be, the idea of the apprenticeship is you, uh, and I meant to say this earlier, I apologize, you apply through the SAA. As in, you, want, you want to be a hearing health care provider. You want to be a hearing aid dispenser. And then somebody who is a uh, journeyman or the apprentice sponsor, they say, I would like to have an apprentice. Their job is basically to put the two together. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, then the, it, it, depending on how this bill goes in the current state, that's already able to happen, and that would become a trainee. They would get a training license. That's how that worked, and they'd be under all of the guises of the training license, uh, as it currently is because of the, 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 the way the laws have, have happened. You can't, this board does not recognize an apprentice as a hearing aid dispenser. Right. So, that's, so they would have to have a training license from that. And the dispenser sponsor would have to be all of the guises of a hearing aid dispenser that, guises, but anyway, <laughs> under the, the hearing aid dispenser, the uh, qualifications requirements free of all type of accusations or any kind of issues that way. So it falls back on those laws at currently. Okay. So I think the conflict here is that um, the IHS distance learning is two years. Mm -hmm. So these, both the okay. apprenticeship and the trainee license would expire prior to someone completing this course. So because it's two years, mm -hmm. the trainee I believe is renewable three times for a total of up to 18, 18 months. 18. Yeah. And then this would be 18 months. So exactly. those two are the same, they're identical, mm -hmm. but in order to sit, as I read it, in order to sit for the examination, you have to do it for two years. So it would expire before you're actually able yeah, to and sit. And the spirit of it is, not, is that it, it can be finished earlier. So I think that the languages can very easily uh, coincide with the same 18 month period, yeah. But if somebody doesn't? It, the apprenticeship program is mainly, it's, it's, it's completing the distance learning program. That's the, that's the apprentice side of it. Uh, the curriculum that's in there. Somebody can finish it faster than a two year period. But at the end of that apprenticeship program, they're given a certi certificate that says that they've completed that. And the idea is now they should be able to go take a written and a practicum and pass and be able to be a hearing aid dispenser from that point right. in time. So, yeah. But I think the problem is, 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 that, the, the is language, that if somebody yeah. does not mm -hmm. do it in the 18 month time, so someone doesn't pass it early, mm -hmm. then their apprenticeship license expires. What I, at this so point, they can't, yeah. they can't necessarily I, correct. finish. Yeah. If, yep. if the apprenticeship piece stays in, we'd be willing to modify that. Yeah. Right. That's what I was asking about. Um, yeah. Real quick on the, on the apprenticeship issue, because um, I know we've talked about this, Vanessa and I have talked about this uh, for quite some time. 
when we were coming up with trainee standards, one of the things we came up against was we were working on all these standards, but we didn't have a requirement for anyone to actually take the training or become a trainee. Mm -hmm. So currently, mm -hmm. a person doesn't even have to be a trainee to take the exam. Right. Yeah. I feel like now we're coming up with an apprenticeship category that is not required. There's, there may be, you know, what is the incentive for someone to do this and why not require it as, um, as a minimum requirement mm -hmm. for taking the exam? HHP is open to that conversation. Mm -hmm. okay. but I, there I, is current structure for that yeah. in 2538.17. So the board may require applicants to first complete the required course of instruction or otherwise satisfy the board that the applicant possesses the necessary background and qualifications to fit or sell hearing aids. The board promulgates regulations to implement this section to require a course of instruction concerned with fitting and selling hearing aids board shall obtain the advice of persons knowledgeable in the preparation and administration of a course of instruction. And I was speaking more to this language, why not require it? Now that we're going through the process of looking at the apprenticeship program, why not make it a requirement rather than something that's just hanging out there that mm -hmm. really doesn't give someone a strong incentive to do it? And mm -hmm. I, I think that there's some cohesion in this discussion here and that we are also frustrated with the fact that we keep coming back to the fact that all we need to do to enter the profession is have a high school diploma and pass the two tests. Yeah. Much rather have a more structured no, training program. Would, yep. Yeah. I, I think I want to give you advice. I think mm -hmm. it's a little bit you, you com, combining two issues in the same bill that you're going to hear, and it's going to be confusing. I think the real what you want to fight is on team, not on so much on the apprentice. So mm -hmm. if you can drop the apprentice from this bill, because this will put you in another objections of, uh, if you read here, this bill would result in significant cost for the board to create a new license type. And, and so, so you don't want another objection that the assembly hears about, oh, this will cost, uh, so. Uh, you better drop the apprentice this time and just fight. I don't know if you win, but fight on the team or alone on this uh, hearing. I appreciate that perspective. Another question I had, I, I know earlier um, Karen Cheng, I think, asked what the ideal bill would be. And um, one thing that hasn't been discussed that's in the, in the fact sheet that we were uh, provided from Assemblyman Bro's office is that the intent of this bill is also to include serum and management. Was that? That's God, I see. That's we, in the narrative. Can you imagine the conversation? And I know that that's the <laughs> conversation. It, well, what is the you, intent there? And you knew where the conversations were over the summer, was that was potentially at play in subsequent conversations with CAA. They had indicated that tympanometry was a concern, but serum and management wasn't necessarily. So it's you know sort of up to this next stakeholder meeting this coming week to figure out where we land on that. Mm -hmm. Would we like to be expressly able to do serum and management? Yes, but that would be another component to this completely. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that we're prepared to have that discussion yet. No. That's what's in his fact sheet. That's what we had envisioned earlier in the year. Yep. But at this point where negotiations are, it's just unclear to us sure. how we land. That, that's just an area that we were kind of scratching our heads yeah. on because we were reading that narrative mm -hmm. and then we were looking at the bill and right. there have mm -hmm. been discussions. So I just want to make everybody aware that Mm -hmm. yeah. or actually find out if that's actually mm -hmm. the intent. Yeah. So. so do you know if that's the It's hard to say where this bill? is going to go. Uh, okay. I, I believe it's easier for us to show that we're performing TIMPS successfully than to, sh yeah. to show that we're performing sermon management successfully currently. And also, like I said, they're used... We go back in the history of, of uh, CEUs in California and the, what's approved. Tympanometry has been approved over and over and over and over again, where sermon management, we, I don't think we've had any any CEUs in, in serum and management in California, IHS has done it, uh, and I know it's been approved by the board, but not at any California conference. So. so so, correct me if I'm wrong, at the crux of everything, what you guys really want is more formal educational programs for the hearing aid dispensers. Absolutely. That's, been, that's basically because all you guys need is high school diploma, high school diploma and to... Yep. 
And as we all know, you know, now that we're also doing 12 CEUs a year, it used to be nine, you know, we're continually being educated, which is a, a double-edged sword, you know, it's the, knowing what you don't know, and then all of a sudden you know not, different not things, not, not being able to it. do anything with it so, as well, so too. So it's yeah. more than just the tympanometry. Uh, at this point in time, I know that the specific two things, tympanometry uh, is the main. Um, the other has been serumin management. We kind of went down that path a couple of years ago. And what, what management? Uh, so uh, management? Uh, earwax cleaning out of ears. Okay. Which there's an argument because we can we can make impressions of the entire ear canal. Uh, earwax usually forms uh, in the non-cartilaginous portion and would be kind of maybe inserted deeper in the ear. I, I don't want to waste the sports time getting too far. <laughs> I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff today, but um, the the theory being that since we're already are doing things inside of the ear, um, why could we not remove a little wax that would be in the way of our ear impression? Uh -huh. w would yeah. this be, I mean, I don't know. Would this be, bill be kind of like more piecemeal for you guys? Because it seems like what you guys want is more like hearing aid audiologists, uh, hearing aid dispensers. They have to tab these more requirements than just a high school diploma and two tests, right? Right. And but, then you guys are yeah. starting with out with tympanometry. Well, the apprenticeship side of that, it already exists uh -huh. federally. Uh -huh. It exists at the state level. It's already, it's already there. And in fact, the distance learning program through IHS has been the most commonly used training for hearing aid dispenser for years. It's what people use. You know, I know every trainee that I've ever had, I purchase that, whatever newest edition they have, and we mm -hmm. start from the beginning and working with that. So it just more or less now it's been ratified at the federal level um, with no opposition from AAA, ADA, ASHLA in this current current edition. So we feel very strong about that curriculum because it's it kind of bridges the gap across all parties that, you know, this what we're learning here is what every Everybody feels should be taught in so is it what you want it you want it codified into law we would like to have it codified in the law to say that a yeah a, a person um, has further training vocational even at that then again we keep coming down to the high school diploma fog up a mirror <laughs> 18 years old or older when uh, you know I feel I've been doing this uh, a long time and I would hope that I'm not compared um, even by my actions, that that's all I know about hearing aids. Is I just graduated high school and I, you know, I'm 18 years old and I passed a couple tests, you know. But I never, I will never call myself a doctor because that's not something that I have earned. Mm -hmm. um, but I also can't go back to school for eight years because I'm doing a practice and in debt two hundred thousand dollars to to call myself a doctor. And that, you know, so so those things are never would never happen in any kind of stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination. So. Can I just ask something? Yeah. When the ABD became the um, entry level degree for a licensure for audiology in the state, 2008, I think it was, what's to prevent HHP from adopting something like this IHS course and or further training and trying to um, get a bill to make their entry level not a high school diploma and pass two tests, but something more substantial? Then I think you'd have a better leg to stand on when you try to take on a diagnostic test like tympanometry or some other element. That's a conversation we're open to having mm -hmm. if, if this is also the opening volley to it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we do have a bill. There are things that we want to accomplish in this bill. But if that opens up another conversation, then we're happy to have it. Yeah, very true. That makes the most sense to me. I mean, it's mm -hmm. otherwise like you alluded to, it's piecemealing, and it's kind of like you're putting the cart before the horse. That the real problem is you want more respect for your profession, those entering um, just out of high school, and I think it would be looking at that level instead of now, let's say, okay, let's make all hearing aid dispensers, give them the ability to perform a diagnostic. And I want to also um, add on Thank administratively, you. The way this bill is currently written with, as far as the apprenticeship standard piece, as long as the trainee license still exists, there's no incentive to go through this program. If, if, you know, if someone's coming into the profession and sees, I can do route A, B, or C, mm -hmm. Why would they do this one that's harder versus when there's two other entryways that aren't? as difficult. I, I love that question. And and the reason behind it, uh, since I've, at the point in time I started uh, uh, as president of HHP, I get uh, numerous requests for people that are looking for trainers. They, there's people that want to get in this industry and there's 
they, they aren't able to find somebody who's doing training because there's no list of people who are looking for trainees in, in any given area. And instead of call, I mean, they could physically call every single license in California. The SAA gives them an opportunity to say, I want to be an apprentice in this field. And then the hearing aid dispenser can also sign up as a journeyman. And as HHP, our job is to promote that sort of a, an avenue when it comes to making HHP sure that can do it right away now. No, you're, you're correct. Because it already exists. Right now yeah, without yeah. Any it, it exists. It was uh, we would we we're trying to create an additional education, mm -hmm. you know, a nod to education that has us in it too. So, yeah. I probably know taking a lot of your time on this one, but <laughs> no. At this point, let's take a ten-minute break. We're dealing with multiple issues here, so let's just take a 10 minute break and get some things settled. Okay. <laughs> so what? Oh, Karen? Well, I, oh. Are, are we back on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to make one um, comment. Um, from the conversations that I was listening, it seems like it's more that you guys want to have more um, formal education for for the hearing aid dispensers that are coming on instead of just a high school diploma and two tests. Um, so I was talking to Kelsey, and she said that, correct me if I'm wrong, Kelsey, <laughs> and she said that we can, inst we can, instead of doing these legislative things for typometry and it seems like it's piecemeal, um, we can actually probably do like a regulation change or a statute change to require certain things, certain educational components for hearing aid dispensers. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a legislation change. So, right, right so um, there, there's the one that I mentioned earlier. It's a uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's five thirty eight point one seven uh -huh. that allows for a course of education. The board to uh, require a course of education prior to licensure. Um, if you if you did want to add something like a different level of education, education such as an AA degree rather than um, high school degree or its equivalency, that would require a statutory change. Um, but as I see it, 2538.17, the course of education, that could be a regulation that the board could promulgate, not today, but at the, yeah. <laughs> at the next agenda meeting. So in response to that, I don't think that we are closed off to that idea. I think our preference would be to do that via legislation. Um, we appreciate the amount of time and energy and attention that the board and especially the board staff put into analyzing our issues and putting together language. It's a really long process. It's longer than a bill would take. A bill does expedite the process a little bit. It keeps pressure on negotiations. So that's part of why we're interested in doing it, but also quite frankly, without having a second hearing aid dispenser appointed to the board, we feel like it's hard to have that conversation in this context on, mm -hmm. on what the full you know, additional pieces to licensure might look like. They might disagree with us. We don't know who that appointee might be. So you, so you guys prefer to have, do like a legislative change for, if, if this, say we were, if say, I don't even know what you guys want, but if say you guys want to have more education, you would rather go through a legislative? At this point, yes. Okay. How long does a regulation change take? About 18 months on a good day. Uh, it is um, a process. Um, so the board has to approve the language. It takes time to first develop that language, mm -hmm. right? Um, the board has to approve the language at a meeting. Um, then it goes through the department-wide approval process. So it goes through my office. Um, it goes through me. It goes through my supervisor. It goes through my supervisor's supervisor. Um, and then it goes to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs, as well as the agency, which is the um, even higher up umbrella over mm -hmm. DCA, um, and they review it. And then it can be filed with the Office of Administrative Law. And then it has a mandatory 45-day comment period for the public comment after that. If there are any changes to regulations between then, um, it's about, it's, 
15 days required minimum. Um, so we're talking about almost two it's a, years. It's a long two process. Years. Okay, okay. And I can and talk to you more about it. And what about Sorry, like I, I can carry you away there. Um, so again, the statute. Same thing, it's a long time. Yes. Okay. In certain circumstances, I would agree with Ms. Kohina's uh, statement that a uh, bill statute, a bill can take less time than a regulation. Okay. Got and it. that's because if they get that, they already have their vehicle right here that we're looking at, mm -hmm. um, and it can be amended throughout the process. And if it's signed by the governor, it becomes effective January 1 of next year. And so that education piece could be in place as soon as okay. January 1. Also with a bill, year. we could extend that timeline on when the bill would go into effect. Mm -hmm. We could, you know, put it out 18 months from signature. We could put it out two years from signature. But it would be with the certainty that we had discussed this and without then having to go through the extra pieces of the regulatory process. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I would move to um, vote on. Do you want me to, give, me to give sort of the board the overview of what you can yes. do with this? Um, as sort of my recommendations, the board can motion to um, support the bill as it's currently written uh, in, in this current format. It has been updated, but I would recommend that you do it in this current format because this is the one we're working off of. Um, you can vote to. Uh, oppose the bill unless amended and articulate specific amendments that you would like to see in the bill and if those amendments were um, introduced into the bill then the board would change their opposed to support um, you can oppose the bill and you can either articulate the reasons for it or not articulate the reasons for it um, you can watch the bill and take no position you can um, and then within that you can also delegate to your executive officer the authority to do certain functions or delegate to your executive officer and chair um, or somebody else on the board to negotiate throughout the process or those types of things. And this is a time where I think because this is a bill that impacts our board where we really need to understand what the board, the direction the board wants for us to take. Okay. Um. Can you talk about possible amendments to the bill? Or no? I think once we've made a determination of what we want to do. I don't know how much support you're going to get from amending. I would just caution on doing a pose unless amended that someone needs to be prepared to actually draft exactly what those okay, amendments right. would be, which involves looking at the language striking out what needs to be struck out, adding in language that needs to be added in, and it's, it's quite a workload. So um, I, if there's major concerns, I try to steer away from oppose unless amended, and maybe rather go the direction of giving our executive officer guidelines of like these are our concerns these are where we're okay as being more of a better option if there's only a few things you have concerns with then it's easier to oh, okay. so-called no, tweak I, the language but if there's major concerns opposing less amended is a huge work uh, it says yeah the, the the staff recommend oppose and says this bill will result in significant cost for the board to create a new license type. Uh, do you know how much? Is it significant? Where are we going to get the revenue for this? Well, so the board is self-funded. Yeah. Um, so our revenue comes from our licensing fees. We haven't delved into the piece of the costs yet for the IT component as far as creating a new license type. Um, but since there was a bill a couple years ago um, that also would have required a new exam, we do have costs on that, and I'm trying to. Give me and, and I'll preface that with saying it was difficult. It's difficult to come up with a fiscal analysis because there were some areas, as you can see from our discussions, that were just unclear. So even even what we're basing some of these numbers that Heather and I have looked at, it's based on some assumptions. Yeah, and I believe those costs for the exam were in the 280000 range. 
Just for the exam piece only. Do the, does the board need to come with an opinion or say the board is no saying at this time? Well, can only? the board just say oppose but give the Reasons. executive we, officer? Give I mean, the executive do we have officer. to come with the, no, we with don't have the to come oppose with or not? You don't have to, but I think you do that with the knowledge that here is a, a bill that's being presented to you that has significant impact on your board. Because too many variants. Here. Because I, the, I know that I know that the um, assembly committee staff are looking for us to take a position. I mean, they they they're curious as to yeah, see what the board thinks. As we're taking the position, this is changing every day. Well, I think keep in mind that you're making you're taking a position based on what's in front of oh. you. Mm -hmm. that, that's why I clarified. You, for instance, the room and management issue. Yeah. That's not in the bill, so we're not taking a position on serum and management. We're taking a position on what's in front of us. But we yeah, can we can all. vote to oppose and um, give executive officer authority to work. That, that's that's, that's a recommendation. I, okay. It, it's helpful to know you know some real clear cut positions that you have. Like for instance, we're talking a lot about the apprenticeship issue, yeah. but the 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 larger issue here is tympanometry, or. or you know, that's what we're looking at right now. But I oppose to the apprentice, I have no problem with the team. So what should they do now? If this is the bill, I oppose because it's part of it. But if it was not a part of it, I wouldn't oppose. That's well, the bill that's in front of you. Yeah, well, so, so that's the so, problem. So, Amnon, what you could do is make a motion to oppose the bill in its current form, delegate authority to the executive officer okay. and say, I'm okay with tympanometry. I am not okay with the new apprenticeship program. Or I'm okay with X, but I'm not okay with Y. And stipulate what that is, and then your executive but, officer can yeah, negotiate but if that. Every board member will have his own. Yeah. So you can do different. We could break down, down the motions even further. We could have, uh, there could be one motion as to whether or not to um, oppose. Uh, well, no, the whole bill. The bill is the whole. Oppose the bill or support the bill or watch the bill. And then based on that outcome, the different, the two different main elements of the bill and break those down when delegating to the executive officer um, your policy. If, that's the, if the board thinks that's the cleanest way. But there, okay. you can do it however you want. That's just one. So different so. members of the board can can have different voices delegated to the executive No, so it would, it would, the motion would need to pass, and whatever motion passed, so if the, mo if the motion is to watch the bill, I'll take the neutral, <laughs> Graham, for my example. <laughs> what is watch the bill? It just means that the, the board's going to continue to monitor it. Um, okay, so that's And not send a letter in support or opposition. Um, so if, for example, the motion is to watch the bill, um, and delegate to the executive officer to be a part of negotiations, though still, um, which seems counterintuitive, but I'm, I mean, I'm going to stick to my example. Um, <laughs> then, uh, and, and that motion passes, and so now the bill, they're watching it, right? So then we're going to do tipinometry, and then the motion could be, um, I, you know, we are not in favor of tipinometry. And then if that motion passes, that is the policy of the board. If the motion doesn't pass, we will need another motion. I'm in favor of tipinometry. And then that motion will need to pass. <laughs> if that motion doesn't pass, we need to, there needs, so one of the motions needs to pass in order for it to be the policy of okay, the board. Okay, so we're doing stepwise okay. motions. Yeah. If that was one way to, <laughs> to handle it. That's one way to, that's one way to handle it if the board feels like there might be multiple viewpoints right. or I'll somebody move. could just step up and make the full motion <laughs> yeah. well, I'll move to oppose I second we'll start with that okay okay it's been moved and seconded to oppose this bill is there any further discussion from members of the board okay any further discussion from members of the public okay then we'll call for the vote yes Yes. 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 Present. Present. That's not a. Huh? Yes. Absent? Abstain. Abstain? Okay. okay. Oh. Yes. Present. Okay. 
right. You can use now. Now can we motion to approve? The bill passes. Three. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the motion passes. <laughs> I'm reading bill here. Okay. Okay, so the motion passes. So, the motion passes. Um, now would you like to delegate to your executive officer yes. the authority to negotiate um, or to engage in negotiation on this bill? Um, and if so, then I would suggest that your motion include the parameters um, of that negotiation. So the Are there two any elements. Lines in the sand that we right. Want to draw at this yeah. point? So I move uh, that the board take positions against uh, typonometry and stop there. Uh, is that uh, he can well, or can, add. Yeah, okay. due to the fact that uh, typonometry is diagnostic and uh, 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 speaks against uh, uh, the uh, role of uh, hearing aid dispensers. One and two. Um, actually, I'm going to stop there. And then about the uh, is there any position on the uh, apprenticeship? Portion of the bill? Uh, so, because it's not spelled out, how I, I guess I would be unclear on how we would have a position against it. So, it's more of negotiation. So, is there a hard line in the sand for the board? You're basically setting the policy, right? If are, we're, are you okay with? the idea if it was fleshed out more if there were more oh, so then i guess we would be against the bill as currently written as there is no uh, specification as to the uh, uh, as to the uh, 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 role of immediate versus direct supervision of the apprentice of the apprentice would it uh, include referring to paul to Negotiate more. Your motion. Right. So That's I think. Yes. Yeah, so, right. so right now this the. This is all the, delegating to the executive. Right. So mm -hmm. so if um, so you're delegating because the direct and indirect supervision. So you're delegating that portion to Paul to negotiate. To negotiate, correct. And that I'm clear on because we have regulations that we've talked about. For direct and indirect. And what about the fact that they're saying supervise up to three? How many are they currently supervising, or how many of the trainees do they supervise? Heather talked about that earlier, and mm -hmm. uh, a supervisor is allowed to supervise one person and can ask for, what do we call it, an exemption? Yeah, I believe three. the board up, is up to authorized, to, is, can authorize up to three, but it's It actually says no more, than three, no more than three, but but the regulation is written for a supervisor to supervise one person, and then they can request to supervise additional, up to three. Okay. So I guess it'll, the indirect and, or immediate versus direct, all that language will help sort some of that out in terms of? Yes, because we actually, we, we came up with some regulatory language that the board approved that I think addresses some of these issues. Okay. And it doesn't sound like, um, the board's opposed to the apprenticeship concept. Right. Yeah. Um, do can I make other suggestions, or only he's allowed to make? Suggestions? So he's allowed to make. So oh, okay. so maybe we should break it down. Maybe break it should it. just. Maybe the motion should be to oppose tipponometry um, as sort of a blanket statement because of um, its diagnostic in nature and and it goes against the role of a hearing aid dispenser, and then we can flesh out maybe a little bit more the other one. So um, is, was there a second to the motion? To oppose to Oh, second. Okay. Moved and seconded that we oppose to penometry. Any further discussion from the board? Okay. From the public? <coughs> All right, then we'll call the vote. Yes. 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 Sorry. Uh, I'll, I, I'm going to have to abstain because I just don't. Yes. Abstain. Yes. Yes. Yes, the motion passes. Okay. Next. So I kind of inherent in the apprenticeship issue is the, the cost to the board yeah. if, if, that, if a new license type is required and or the cost in nature of an examination 
I have a, I want to move a motion about the apprentice. I'm opposing the apprentice hearing a dispenser license as a duplicate, identical duplicate to the trainee license, which is now. It will just incur more cost for us to create a duplicate license that exists right now. This for, for our executive officer is going to investigate that. Is that mm -hmm. the point of these motions? Yes. This yes. is delegating to mm -hmm. your executive officer the authority to negotiate um, the language. So he needs to look at that issue and the costs associated. Well, I think Abner is making a motion right now. Yeah, I make a motion to oppose uh, creating a new license, apprentice license, what we have right now, a trainee license, which is identical in regulations. So you're opposed to it as written? Huh? Yeah. You're opposed to the apprenticeship yes. component as written? Yeah. Because we right now we have a trainee license to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So is there any um, any negotiations that your executive officer could engage in that would uh, move you away from the oppose? I, d I don't see unless you can open a discussion and see what m make me change my mind. Is it appropriate now as public comment to comment? Let's on wait for the okay. motion to be so so because right now so the bill at, as a whole yeah tipponometry and um, apprentice. the apprenticeship is the board is opposing the bill as it's written currently um now the uh the last motion was to all to delegate to the executive officer the ability to negotiate the language um and the policy um that he's allowed to negotiate is that um, the removal of tympanometry and the reasons behind that. Um, so now in talking about the apprenticeship, um, if there is the ability for um, the, your executive officer to negotiate changes that would make the apprenticeship something that the board would support. I, I think if we will just put in the current regulation, trainee slash apprentice will solve all the problems. Well, I do, I think, if I could speak, I think the, the issue that's not being addressed by doing that is the educational component. And I think that's something that, I mean, I commend HHP for looking in that direction and saying, you know, we don't want to be seen as 18 year olds with high school diplomas because we have a lot of people that are experts in their field and by doing this, that brings some qualifications to the the applicant prior to taking the exam. Yeah, but this doesn't this doesn't Does that, address the education here. Right. Well, I so, think it could though, right? So the, the point is, is that our, can your executive officer negotiate it to a point where it could? Is there length? Could this language be changed? Yeah. Of to course. conform to a, a policy that the board has. So it could be different than. So it could be sufficiently different than the trainee license. Mm -hmm. The apprentice license could be sufficiently different than the trainee license. That's what Paul could potentially but, negotiate. But, uh, but and you're not canceling trainee status. Right. No. So if so, you well, have you a two program. I, I understand. I'm not <laughs> yeah. concerned. I have the same concern. But <laughs> but I do think that we can't ignore the the benefit of having a training requirement. Mm -hmm. No, we, we can think about how we raise the level of hearing a dispenser requirement above uh, mm -hmm. high school. Maybe request one year experience as a used car salesman or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> solar, two bit solar <laughs> salesman. <laughs> Going door to door. I, I, I think that's, or for me, I'm just speaking for myself, that's eventually what I want to get no, to. Yeah, we can where where what Paul was saying, like the education component, what you guys, I think you guys want, is yeah. the education component to be yeah. elevated. Right. And some someone in this group needs to figure out the wording to, to do it so that we could take a vote. So we were back on Amnon's motion, and I think Kelsey was just trying to get clarification <laughs> on your motion, <laughs> um, I'm not trying to give you the motion. She's trying to get clarification okay. on what you're asking. So, yeah. so if the bill was changed to add an educational element to uh, hearing aid dispensers. It's, I, I, I guess we would have to flesh out whether or not it's no. within the practitioner. It's or not. A, a, you, you, you're writing a, a, a different issue from here. But they, mean, but that, but that can be done. So uh, I think that 
Um, but it doesn't sound like you're that I, 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 you want to make. Yeah. I think no, I just books. don't want to have two licenses, <laughs> trainee and apprentice. It's confusing, it's duplicate, as it is. But if the HHP wants to come with the legislation to raise the level, the entry level, let's say to, uh, I don't know if they want full college or just. Uh, okay, so maybe your motion is that um, you're delegating to the executive officer the authority to negotiate the duplicativeness of the trainee and apprenticeship licenses licenses and uh, raising the entry level for hearing aid yeah. dispensers as a whole and without causing any additional cost to and the board. and looking at costs yeah. for the board so it, does yes. that sound like the motion you're trying mm -hmm. to make okay is there a second to that one I'll second that okay. Okay. moved and seconded is there any further discussion I just want to ask Vanessa if she had any more comments. I think that motion okay. carries it perfectly. <laughs> I love you. the word duplicate. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> I applaud you for being able to get it out. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. Let's yes. call the vote. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Back over to Heather. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours later. Um, if, if I may, I just want to say thank you to the staff for a very thoughtful conversation and framework that you've laid out, and very much to the board members for also helping us guide this conversation. Thank you. So, um, in the interest of time, if it's okay with the board, um, I did prepare the memo for you that was in tab four. There were several bills that I recommended just watch, and so really they are more just for your information. If it is okay with you, I can skip over those bills, and then you have them as a reference point, and I will keep watching them. And if they become of concern, bring them to the board again. Uh, so that is AB 193, AB 312, AB 476, AB 862, which has actually since been amended to uh, address a DMV issue, so I can actually take it off our list completely if that's okay with you. Um, <coughs> AB 1545, <coughs> SB 425. SB 601, and there is one more that I recommend watch, but I do want to cover, which is SB 617. So if it's okay with you, I'll skip over the bills. You do have the information about them in the memo, um, and if you feel like you need me to go back over any of them, I'm happy to, but I will continue to monitor them. So is that okay Thank with you. the board? Okay. Six seventeen. Six seventeen. Six seventeen. Oh, sorry, I got dyslexic. Oh, you do mean the six seventeen? Okay. Yes, I do want to discuss that because it does currently, it is currently within our jurisdiction. But I'll get to that one at the end. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Did you? All right. Okay. Okay. So. Um, oh, sorry. Just quickly. So um, I do want to call attention. It is a watch, but AB three twelve. Um, would create significant work for your board. Um, and so I just do want to call your attention to that. Um, there have been previous iterations of this bill that have not gone anywhere, um, but it keeps getting reintroduced. But it would be a significant workload. Sorry, which one? AB, uh, AB 312. 312. Oh, okay. 
Okay. Yes, that is correct. And the only reason I recommend watch is because I've been in legislation for 10 years and I think I've seen this bill uh, all 10 of those yes. years <laughs> and it's never gone anywhere. <laughs> and it's actually already on the appropriation suspense file with a $2 million price tag. So I'm pretty sure it's not going anywhere. Um, but if for some reason it does move, I will definitely bring it to the next board meeting um, for taking a position. Okay, so with all that, um, I am going to jump to AB 598 Bloom, which is regarding hearing aids for minors, and you will find that in tab 4E. Um, so this bill would require health plans and health insurance policies to include coverage for hearing aids every five years for all enrollees under 18 years of age when medically necessary. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this before you, um, it does not directly impact the board. Um, however, I think that since um, both audiologists and hearing aid dispensers um, may be working with minors who have hearing loss, um, that it would be nice for the board to support the bill to help ensure that children diagnosed with hearing loss are able to receive necessary medical devices to improve their hearing. Um, this bill is already supported by the California Academy of Audiology as well as the California Speech and Hearing Association, among others, including our former chair, Allison Grimes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just wanted to bring it f to your attention. Yeah, it's uh, more on theologies. I think we are not, uh, as, as hearing okay. the dispenser cannot do minors. So. Okay. They can fit medical mm. children. Huh? They can fit medical children. Yeah, a hearing a dispenser? Yeah. I you can't do know. the diagnostics, but you can fit the hearing aid. Oh, I see. But. Today, nobody referring, the referrers as is doing it. Yeah, that's yeah. probably how it works. But just like you said about the other bill, this one has also been brought up every year, at least the last five years. And, you know, I'm totally in support of it, but it just, I think the insurance lobby is pretty strong and it, it never goes anywhere. I, I wish there was something that could intercede, but I don't know what that would take. But we should support. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have seen this bill. I, that same author too. Okay. <laughs> I know the medical lobby is quite strong, but um, one of my goals for this board in general is to, now that you guys have a legislative person, to help get you guys more, I don't know the right word necessarily, but to be more active in legislation, to kind of um, build relationships with legislators. Um, I think that will help in the sunset process as well as, you know, in the future if the board wants to do their own legislation, that it's good to have goodwill with legislators and where we can support things. I think it'd be nice to have our voice out there um, and bring more awareness to our board in general. So is there any questions about this bill? Um, I did include the language in there as well as a fact sheet about the problem and the solution and it does have a list of all the other organizations that are in support already as well. I move to support. Who was against this bill? I remember working on you mm -hmm. and um, right. Allison working on this a lot in prior years trying to get this going. Who, who's against this bill? There's no register. No, well, no, so, no. yeah, <laughs> yeah, like CMA, um, health plans, um, and there's quite a heavy lobby. And, uh, Why would CMA be against it? Because they represent insurance companies. Well, because of medical groups, and it oh. would increasing their. Um, like costs for the medical groups in general. It's not necessarily the individual doctors. CMA likes to oppose almost everything. Uh -huh. Or in medical general. group that are insurance companies, that are small group that insure their people. What do you call, why medical group 
will oppose. No medical groups. Yes. Why? Why they oppose? Because of costs. What cost to them? Just the cost of providing services in general. You're talking about hearing aids, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what, what kind of service they give to hearing aids? They Do you know just the cost of med so just the co health care costs in general. The medical community doesn't like to add additional services. Additional benefits. And I think I think without I, I think without getting too sidetracked, I, it's clear that there are some groups maybe that would oppose it, maybe insurance groups. But insurance. the yeah, question is now, does the board have a motion to support? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I, 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 I second. Okay. Right. I second. Okay. Right. Somebody. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Yes. Oh, yes. 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 Yes.
or they choose to be inactive. In order to be inactive, they pay the same fees as an active person. The only thing they don't have to do is their CE. So if someone calls us and says, hey, I, I don't want to have my license anymore. How can I cancel it? We tell them now you have to let it expire. So this bill attempted to address that. But the problem that we have with the bill is that the bill says if someone is just delinquent and they're still practicing and they come back to us four years later, we cannot collect those accrued fees. So then what is the incentive for someone to continue paying their licensing fees if they know that four years from now they don't have to pay the accrued fees, they only have to pay the most recent renewal fees and the delinquent fee. Right. All I wanted, all I was asking is do you let them know up front there will be? It's in law. Yeah. Okay. It's in law. So it's 50% of just the last year? So, 50% of all delinquent years? So what this is saying is 50%, the inactive fee can be no more than 50% of the current renewal fee. But it's also saying that for those that go delinquent, they only have to pay the most, this is now for delinquent active, they only have to pay the most recent fee yeah. the, oh. and the delinquency fee, which is a pretty minimal fee. A, no, I go along with the fee. That, that, so that's why we oppose it, right, Heather? Did I say it? Yes. Okay. What board would support that? Most likely none of them are. <laughs> but the problem is almost all boards are having their meetings in the same time frame. So, you know, we don't have any boards that are on record yet of being opposed. Um, and so for this one, I am recommending oppose. However, um, when I write the letter to the legislature and letting them know of our position, I can say that our concern lies more with the delinquency piece um, instead of being concerned about having the inactive fee being 50% um, of, the, of the fee for our active license. So if anyone wants to make a motion on that or has any questions, or I can just keep watching it too. We don't have to necessarily take a position either. I would move to oppose. To oppose. <laughs> you moved, did you second? I second. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? All right. Yes. 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 So now I'm going to go to AB 613. Um, this is Professions and Vocations Regulatory Fees, and you will find that in 4F. So this bill would authorize all DCA boards to increase licensing fees w once every four years based on the California Consumer Price Index for the preceding four years. Um, this bill would provide the board with an alternative method to increase fees without going through the lengthy legislative and regulatory process. Um, so currently, if we need to increase our fees, we need to make sure our statute has a maximum amount we could go up to, and then we have to go through the lengthy like, regulatory process to do that. This bill would give us an automatic um, based on whatever inflation was over that four year period, we could increase our fees. Um, the bill as currently drafted is slightly unclear um, as far as um, if the current process would still be allowed to be used or if we would have to use this process. I have spoken with um, the legislative staffer working on this bill and was told that both processes um, can still be used. Um, but it was recommended by DCA Legislative Office that um, when we write our support letter, if we choose to take a support position, that the bill should be, clear, should be more specific and clarify that. And we don't necessarily <coughs> need to write amendments for the bill, we can just say, that it's a concern we want to point it out and um, legislative staff already is in agreement that they want it to be both processes so um, I think that just voicing our opinion that we would like the clarification will 
um, make that, they'll probably most likely make that amendment. I move to, uh, I just want to, oh, yeah, no questions? Later? Yeah, no, you want to discuss uh, I thought we had developed a, a rulemaking file already. I'm trying to increase fees a couple of years ago. Th this would actually, if we had this in place, we wouldn't go. We just wouldn't pursue that. We wouldn't, well, we but wouldn't necessarily have to go that. through all the workload oh, we're work. going through right now. Okay, so we are in the, still in the midst of yes. trying to do it. Yes, we are. And that, that would just go away if this were to pass. Well, this would be an alternative to that, I believe. Yeah. 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 But there might be but there might be situations where this path wouldn't be what you needed because if if for example um, the cost of doing business the cost is greater, of doing business is greater mm -hmm. right. um, and you might get to a point where you meet your statutory maximum by going through this route, and then you need to get an increase, and the legislature might say. You have this alternate route. You can do it, and that might not be enough. I don't. That's, that's, that's where we are now. That's mm -hmm. where we're at our ceiling with this new proposed uh, rulemaking. But market. the scenarios that, that Kelsey has described would be addressed in the cl clarifications that we would seek, mm -hmm. right? Right. Well, and if there's structural imbalance, a two percent inflation rate is not might not be enough money yeah. to just increase your fees by. That's why we want to clarify in this law that we can still use the current process of developing regulations or changing our statutory maximum if we need to. This is just an alternate process that can be used to cover every year staff costs go up, every year our rent may go up. That type of thing can be covered with just a consumer price index, possibly. Um, High enforcement costs may not be covered by inflation alone and may need to go through the current process. So you could, but we're likely to be looked at like, um, don't need that because you have this alternative? That's what Kelsey no, said. Not necessarily. I think that that's something, that, that's the type of clarification that DCA is seeking. We don't want to be limited to just this. We want to have the flexibility to pursue a, a fee increase if needed. So if it doesn't pass, then we can continue with the process. Yes, but this would be this would be beneficial to the board mm -hmm. because then you wouldn't have to have the workload of constantly going back yeah. with regulations. Okay. <clears throat> so Heather, do we want to support um, and give staff authority to to uh, negotiate amendments? <coughs> we can. Um, or I think we could just outline it in our letter. Okay. That because I, I, I was at a legislative roundtable meeting last week, and several boards brought up this concern. So I believe several boards are going to be writing in their letter that they would like to see clarification in the law, and it is the legislative staff's intent that um, both processes can be used. So I believe that. If they see it as an, boards are having an issue with it, they're not going to, I think they'll be okay with making that amendment on their own. I don't think they would necessarily need us to draft that language for okay. them. Okay. Any discussion? <coughs> okay. Someone would like to make a motion? I motion to support. I motion to support um, AB 613. Second. And in that motion, are you also um, delegating the authority to, yes. within the letter, seek that clarification? Yes. That, we, that was discussed. Okay. Right. Thank you. A second. Okay. Last vote? Yes. 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 Okay. So the next one I'm going to move on to is AB 1075 Holden California State University Speech Language Pathologist Programs. Um, this bill would appropriate 750,000 to the CSU system for competitive grants to campus speech language pathologist programs with the goal of expanding their enrollment capacity. Um, and although this bill would not 
create any workload for the board or directly impact the board. Um, I think the additional need for SLPs is very well documented, very well known by this board. Um, and this is an opportunity to get more money to the CSUs um, to help them expand their program. I think this would be an excellent bill for our board to support to say, yes, we need more SLPs and we want the legislature to help address that issue. We can make the same argument for audiologists, though. Why isn't that in here? <laughs> we can bell. make a motion to support, if amended, to include audiologists. I would say if audiology programs need, you know, the workforce needs are as, as nearly as compelling. Then they're probably going to split that money, seven fifty. Yeah, that's half, that's <laughs> half of it goes to speech path. Yeah, but that's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> Retired. Oh. <laughs> Retired seven days a week. <laughs> so is there any questions, comments? The bill did pass out of its first committee. Um, it was actually on consent, consent <coughs> with no opposition. Um, so it'll move on to the appropriations committee. So it was very encouraging that there was no opposition on the bill. We survived Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. Is it likely to go and suspend that, that number? You know, I, I think it will be put on suspense, but then they, so the way suspense works is they put anything that's a high cost there and then look at the total docket of all bills with a high cost and then kind of decide yeah, we're okay with this one, we're okay with this one, but we're not okay with this one. Um, I mean, I can't anticipate what the final outcome will be, um, <laughs> but I would like to see it pass, I think. It would be good. And 750000 is not really that much money. <laughs> um, it's only going to make a small dent, but a small dent is better than no dent. Any size dent will make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I. Are we? Are we still? Can I move? Mm -hmm. To make. I move to um, support AB 1075. Is there a second? I second. <laughs> okay. Let's vote. Uh, yes. No. no I would. Do you want to add audiology, audiology add? programs in the CSU? So you want to, well, then that would we be a motion to support. Yeah, yeah you, right. you need to I vote on. discuss that later? No. Well, I well, mean, it, said that it could be. Uh, I want to add a hearing aid. <laughs> 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 so, so it'll end That's up being 100. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want support, if amended, that needs to be a separate motion from okay. Karen's. Yeah. So Sorry, I thought I had to wait to say anything. Oh. Well, I vote yes. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Somebody whisper yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you vote? Yes. Oh. Oh, you thought I'm asking. <laughs> I thought you were asking. Yeah, okay. because I heard that. No, I mean I'm with hearing it, but it still was a whisper. <laughs> kind of were not ready to support. I like came between. <laughs> okay, yes. so I can do another motion now. Well, that one, That's I don't board, know, that the one. The board supports the bill. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Board voted to support the bill. I don't know, Kelsey, I defer to you. It, uh, yeah, I mean, you, had, it, oh. you just told me I couldn't say anything. I had to wait. No, no, no. <laughs> so, it's, not, it's not that you couldn't say anything, but that there was a motion and a second already. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the motion and the second was to support the bill without the the addition okay. of audiologists. I, I understood that. Okay. They said, but you can... You can make, you can make a motion for support if amended. Uh, right, you can make a motion to support if amended, um, it, it, but it, your motion is also to... It's okay, so your first motion would need to be that... <laughs> to retract what the board just, the action the board just took. And have um, a discussion. And have a discussion. <laughs> right. And then vote on that. And then you can make the motion to support if amended. Or what if what if next year we just uh, sponsor a bill to yeah. increase funding for audiologists? Yeah, let's and more funding for SLPs too. 
And more funding for hearing aid dispensers, too. <laughs> no, we're just kidding. Yeah. I, I, by supporting this, we're by no means saying there isn't a shortage in audiology as well. Um, but someone else came up with this idea, proposed it, and yeah. I mean, we it. need it. I don't think Probably that's people. enough money. So I, I think agree. we should move to raise the gas tax. So in the California, <laughs> in order to fund all these programs. So this is not on the agenda. I would recommend that we, the board, do not discuss the gas tax. <laughs> Thank you, Kelsey. We need that legal counsel. I wasn't even going to mention that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next one. Um, the next one is SB 53 Wilk Open Meetings, um, and that's 4K in your binder. So this bill would require two member advisory committees acting in an official capacity of a state body to hold open public meetings if the advisory committee is supported by state funds. This bill would impact the ability of board staff to work with board members to review documents, provide expert analysis, or work on regulatory language without giving public notice. Opening all advisory committee activities to the public would increase the board's cost for staff to attend meetings and pay for public meeting space. Board staff is recommending the board adopt a post position. Now, this bill has been seen before um, and was vetoed by Governor Brown in the past. However, as you all know, we now have Governor Newsom and it's unknown um, this bill is flying through the legislature. Um, it's actually, as of Wednesday, was already on the Senate floor. Um, so it's a real unknown if this hits Governor Newsom's desk, um, what he would do. Um, pr in prior versions of the bill, many DCA boards did have an opposed position. Um, currently, the Board of Accountancy is the only one that has an opposed position on um, this one, but I would imagine we will see more boards um, with opposed positions in the new future. So the real concern here is I am not an expert in any of your professions. Um, so when it comes to writing regulations, um, it's very challenging for Kelsey and I to work on it together kind of in a vacuum like we don't have expertise we need to work with if we're working on slipper regulations we need to work with SLPs to understand what are the parameters what is practice um, you know if we're dealing with the audiology issue I need to work with audiologists you know if for hearing aids I need to work with a hearing aid dispenser um, and by this bill if we're doing that, I believe even through email, it would need to be a posted, it would need to be done in a public forum. We would need to notice the meeting. We would need to invite the public. I would imagine we would have zero public show up, but the law would still require us to do so. Right, so it would still, it, um and what she's talking about on email serial meetings. So, you know, if I have an email, I can, I can be the hub of the serial meeting, even though I'm not a board member, but if multiple board members are talking to me and I'm relaying the message, um, that can be a serial. So if it's two, um, just recently there with AB 2138, um, there was a two board members that were used to um, look at the legislation and make some decisions on the regulations. Um, so those would need to be noticed. They'd have to be noticed 10 days in advance. Um, they'd have to be in a public place uh, with accessibility. So there's a lot of uh, moving parts, right? The board meeting is a production. And so now uh, it would be, the, the rule of two would no longer apply. So is there any questions? Anyone want to make a motion? Mm -hmm. <laughs> guidance? I want, I want to oppose. <laughs> guidance? Oppose. Oppose. I motion to 
Well, can we have a motion? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we have about a million. Can we have a motion? <laughs> I think we know how this is going to go, but a motion. Yeah. I, I, I move to oppose. <laughs> Did oh. you have a question? Well, I motion to oppose, but then in your letter to like really emphasize what Kelsey was saying, like the cost and the tediousness of all of that. And I think it's especially frustrating because here we are, full board meeting, and we didn't have a huge crowd. And imagine if it's three <laughs> people meeting and we do all this and we have absolutely no one come. I, I think the other... Um, Part of this is, I mean, the, the big, bigger picture is transparency, and I don't. I think the argument there is that you're not losing transparency because the, it's still board business, and and your board is not delegating um, anything to these two people. But um, those sort of informal meetings now become something different. Um, but the board will still have to go through the decision making process as a full board. So, so the example 2138, those regulations were developed um, with two board members, but the full board had the opportunity and the public had the opportunity to weigh in on them and will continue to have the opportunity to weigh in, in on them. Um, and so we, I think there's an argument to be made that there isn't a loss of transparency by keeping the status quo. Okay, so I motion to well, we have a motion, we and I'm really for a second. A second, okay. We can discuss. Do you second? I second. Okay. Well, well. Yes. 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 Give me just a minute to finish writing. Heather, those are all the position. Those are all the the um, bills that had recommended positions, right? Yes. So I, I would say now, for the for the sake of time, assuming that you've all read your board materials, on those positions that have a watch position, does anyone have any concerns about those positions, or are there any other issues that we'd want to bring up about those bills? Um, no. Any of those? Kelsey did bring up the one that would have a significant impact, but um, it was one that I... I yeah, just referring to the ones that are here in yeah. front of us? The, I don't believe there's any okay. that I'm concerned about that we need to look at that I think we're, we'll okay. go anywhere. Okay. And yeah. I think we're ready to move on. So, so the next issue that we were going to discuss. Um, oh, I'm looking wait, at the minutes. I do need to go back to one. Sorry, okay. the six yeah. seventeen, which ties into. So that's um, SB six seventeen. Um, Glazer audiologist and hearing aid dispensers sales of hearing aids. That's four N. Um, so this bill, um, as of, again, I've been out of the office since Thursday, so I don't know if it has since been amended, but um, it would require a hearing aid dispenser and audiologist to provide an electronic copy of a receipt upon the sale of a hearing aid if requested by the consumer. I have reached out to legislative staff working on this bill uh, numerous times. Um, I was initially told that the idea behind the bill is that hearing aids are expensive um, and it's important that consumers have their receipt to um, reference back if there's ever an issue that they have a record um, and that it should be sent electronically if a consumer requests it so that because a piece of paper it's easy to get lost. Um, if you have it in your email, unless you delete it, it's less likely to get lost. So that was what I was initially told about the bill. Um, they did schedule a hearing, um, and the analysis that was put forward for that hearing was to the effect that that was their goal of the bill. And then they didn't hear the bill in committee when it was scheduled. 
Meanwhile, Paul and I had both been trying to reach out to get information, like, what are you really trying to do here? Like, it just seemed like a spot bill, like there wasn't really any teeth to it. We weren't getting really clear information. Um, and so then I was told they're going to amend the bill to something else. But no clear communication with... So at this point, this bill is not going to move forward as it, as it was Well, what we've been, we've been told, it's not going to move right. forward, but we haven't been told really what it is going to be. And meanwhile, it's clearly in our jurisdiction of something that, you so know, this is, is relevant to us. This is a watch too, right? Yeah, I am recommending watch just because right. we don't know what's going to happen. Um, but I am concerned if it does start moving forward in the current form that we don't have a position. And so I think perhaps a motion to delegate to Paul to um, negotiate amendments if it does move forward as is. So I just looked it up. Okay, has it, it been since amended? It is now about pharmacy technicians. Okay, perfect. Was that a... Which I also need to know problem. about, yeah. <laughs> was that as of Thursday? Uh, it's got, it's got, it's got, yeah. So it was a spot bill all along. Okay. Um, it was amended on April 10th, 2019. Okay. I had a feeling, but you know, as I, I checked on before I left and it was still in us and I'm like, I'm not sure what's going on. So we don't so, even have to So take the position. people are just no. using us, huh? Okay. For putting bills in the calendar and then get in the number. Uh, yeah, I think sometimes <laughs> authors have ideas that they're gonna do something and then something else comes up. So, but since it was clearly in us, I'm like, we better know what this is about, but we weren't getting clear direction. <clears throat> The next board item is uh, item number five, proposed locked hearing aids disclosure from hearing aid dispensers and dispensing audiologists. Uh, we've talked about this issue um, for, for some time, and I think at the last uh, board meeting, um, we discussed finding whether we should pursue finding a sponsor for the bill and you know maybe having a legislative committee start drafting a legislative proposal for next year. So the question is, does the board want to um, have a legislative committee look at this as a future bill for next year? I think the legislative committee should look at it. Um, is, is there some preference to have um, our board do the bill rather than getting a professional organization to I, try to sponsor it? I think that's really up to the board, whether the board wants to, you know, we, we have more control over it if we do it. If we think that there's, um, you know, support for doing something like that, then we could even work together. Does it cost us money to, to develop a bill, find an author, do or? Well, I would say yes, <laughs> but I don't know that, um, that it's a significant enough cost to prevent us from pursuing it. Especially if we feel that this is a consumer protection issue. Oh, is. So, in terms of s mm -hmm. taking steps to do this, if the legislative committee started to develop some language, that would they also then seek that author? Yes. Mm -hmm. And seek support from the professional organizations too. Okay, I would. Affordability. <laughs> so we don't. We don't need for Dean to do this, right? To put the one committee to look at this. Um, not for me, but I think that it would be a good idea to have the board motion to, to do it, to have to, the policy is that the board Then wants, it would be yes. Yes. Okay. Then. And then D, with her um, yeah. abilities as chair, would be able to appoint people not in this setting. You don't have to do it today, or you don't have to have okay. a motion. You have the okay. you've been delegated the authority okay. to appoint. So wouldn't be the, the legislative committee already in existence? Would it be a new one, or one just for this bill, just for this? I think that's up to the board chair. <laughs> okay, what do you want done? <laughs> well, Debbie and I have just so so yeah. legislative committee. Right. 
So I think what legal right counsel right. is suggesting that we entertain a motion to move forward in that manner, appointing a, having you appoint a subcommittee for this. Or if there's already one in existence before, you can just motion that the committee look at this and develop right. language. Marcia and um, okay. Debbie have been doing that. So if the board's in agreement on that, I think the motion would just be that um, the legislative committee that's Don't in listen. existence mm -hmm. take a look at this and develop language. Yeah. Is that okay with the board? Yes. Okay. So, can we make a motion? I motion to approve. Okay. No, that the, the, the legislative committee will follow this proposal on lock tyranny. Okay. Is there a second? What you just said. That's what I said. What so you said. That's I, how you said. I moved. Yes, I moved. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Let's, no discussion. Let's call for the vote. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. Great. We did have that legislative committee. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They've been working on it. Thank you. Now, do we want to know where we're going next? We're on number six. Doing? Future agenda. All right. Items. You, you can send me your agenda items. And um, our future board meeting dates are in August and November. Brianne, do we already have dates for those? No, we need to get that. Okay. Um, okay. Would it be preferable to have board members send us their dates rather August than us trying to open our calendars here? So right. can everybody do your homework <laughs> and send me dates? Thursdays and Fridays. First, Friday. second options, third options for August and November. Okay. Let's avoid Thanksgiving. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know you want to go oh to August and August and November. So I'm not free on August. I'm free on August. So I know Amnon doesn't want to be in Sacramento in August. So uh, we want to say San Diego. San Diego's August, and good. Then yes. I, I, think it's di I think it's difficult to set the specific locations until we've actually negotiated contracts. So I would just leave. I would. Okay. Hold off on that. And I don't think any board members have a problem with coming to Sacramento, right? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Easy. All right. Yeah. We're good. Yeah, that's fine. Unless it's the heat. We'll I promise you we'll have air conditioning. <laughs> What's the weather nice like, though, in San Diego in uh, November? It's uh, so nice. Oh. <laughs> So is meeting adjourned? Is meeting adjourned? Are we adjourned, pardon? Madam Chair. Oh, yes. We're adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.